Chapter 23, Part 2 of The Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Trial by Jury, Part 2. A common jury is one returned by the sheriff according to the directions of the statute 3 George II, C-25, which appoints that the sheriff shall not return a separate panel for every separate cause as formerly, but one in the same panel for every cause to be tried at the same assizes, containing not less than 48 nor more than 72 jurors and that their names being written on tickets shall be put into a box or glass, and when each cause is called, twelve of these persons whose names shall be first drawn out of the box shall be sworn upon the jury, unless absent, challenged, or excused, and unless a previous view of the lands or tenements or other matters in question shall have been thought necessary by the court in which case six or more of the jurors returned, to be agreed upon by the parties, or named by a judge or other proper officer of the court, shall be appointed to take such view. And then such of the jury as have appeared upon the view, if any, shall be sworn on the inquest previous to any other jurors. These acts are well calculated to restrain any suspicion of partiality in the sheriff or any tampering with the jurors when returned. As the jurors appear when called, they shall be sworn unless challenged by either party. Challenges are of two sorts, challenges to the array and challenges to the polls. Challenges to the array are at once an exception to the whole panel in which the jury are arrayed or set in order by the sheriff in his return, and they may be made upon account of partiality or some default in the sheriff or his under-officer who arrayed the panel. And, generally speaking, the same reasons that before the awarding of the venere were sufficient to have it directed to the coroners or elizers will be also sufficient to quash the array when made by a person or officer of whose partiality there is any tolerable ground of suspicion. Also, though there be no personal objection against the sheriff, yet if he arrays the panel at the nomination or under the direction of either party, this is good cause of challenge to the array. Formerly, if a Lord of Parliament had a cause to be tried, and no knight was returned upon the jury, it was a cause of challenge to the array. But an unexpected use having been made of this dormant privilege by a spiritual lord, though his title to such privilege was very doubtful, it was abolished by statute 24 George II, C. 18. Also, by the policy of the ancient law, the jury was to come de vicinetto, from the neighborhood of the ville or place where the cause of action was laid in the declaration, and therefore some of the jury were obliged to be returned from the hundred in which such ville lay. And, if none were returned, the array might be challenged for defect of hundred oars. Thus the Gothic jury, or nemda, was also collected out of every quarter of the country, inus, trinos, vel etium senos, ex singulus territori quadrantibus. For, living in the neighborhood, they were properly the very country or pious to which both parties had appealed, and were supposed to know beforehand the characters of the parties and witnesses, and therefore the better knew what credit to give the facts alleged in evidence. But this convenience was overbalanced by another very natural and almost unavoidable inconvenience, that jurors, coming out of the immediate neighborhood, would be apt to intermix their prejudices and partialities in the trial of right. And this our law was so sensible of, that it for a long time has been gradually relinquishing this practice, the number of necessary hundred oars in the whole panel, which in the reign of Edward III were constantly six, 
being in the time of Fortescue, reduced to four. Afterwards, indeed, the statute 35 Henry VIII C6 restored the ancient number of six, but that clause was soon virtually repealed by statute 27 Elizabeth C6, which required only two. And Sir Edward Coke also gives us such a variety of circumstances whereby the courts permitted this necessary number to be evaded that it appears they were heartily tired of it. At length, by statute 4 and 5 and C16, it was entirely abolished upon all civil actions except upon penal statutes, and upon those also by the 24 George II C18, the jury being now only to come de corpore comitas from the body of the country at large, and not de vicinetto or from the particular neighborhood. The array by the ancient law may also be challenged if an alien be party to the suit and, upon a rule obtained by his motion to the court for a jury de mediatate linguae, such a one be not returned by the sheriff, pursuant to the statute 28 Edward III C18, which enacts that where either party is an alien born, the jury shall be one half aliens and the other denizens, if required for the more impartial trial. A privilege indulged to strangers in no other country in the world, but which is as ancient with us as the time of King Ethelred, in whose statute de Montecolis Wallai, then aliens to the crown of England, cap three, it is ordained that duodene legales homines. Quorum sexuali et sex anglierunt, anglisetualis justicunto. But where both parties are aliens, no partiality is to be presumed to one more than another, and therefore by the statute 21 Henry VI C4, the whole jury are then directed to be denizens. And it may be questioned whether the statute 3 George II C25 before referred to hath not in civil cases undesignedly abridged this privilege of foreigners by the positive directions therein given concerning the manner of impaneling jurors and the persons to be returned in such a panel, so that the court might probably hesitate, especially in the case of special juries, how far it has now a power to direct a panel to be returned de mediatate linguae and to alter the method prescribed for striking a special jury or balloting for common jurymen. Challenges to the polls, in capita, are exceptions to particular jurors, and seem to answer the recusiatio judicis in the civil and canon laws, by the constitutions of which a judge might be refused upon any suspicion of partiality. By the laws of England also, in the times of Bracton and Fleta, a judge might be refused for good cause, but now the law is otherwise, and it is held that judges or justices cannot be challenged. For the law will not suppose a possibility of bias or favor in a judge who is already sworn to administer impartial justice, and whose authority greatly depends upon that presumption and idea. And should the fact at any time prove flagrantly such, as the delicacy of the law will not presume beforehand, there is no doubt but that such misbehavior would draw down a heavy censure from those to whom the judge is accountable for his conduct. But challenges to the polls of the jury, who are judges of the fact, are reduced to four heads by Sir Edward Coke, propter honoris respectum, propter defectum, propter affectum, and propter delectum. 1. Propter honoris respectum. As if a Lord of Parliament be impaneled on a jury, he may be challenged by either party, or he may challenge himself. 2. Propter defectum. As if a juryman be an alien born, this is a defect of birth. If he be a slave or bondman, this is a defect of liberty, and he cannot be liber et legalis homo. Under the word homo also, though a name common to both sexes, the female is however excluded, propter defectum sexus.
except when a widow feigns herself with child in order to exclude the next heir and a supposititious birth is suspected to be intended then upon the writ de ventre in speciendo a jury of women is to be impaneled to try the question whether with child or not but the principal deficiency is defect of a state sufficient to qualify him to be a juror this depends on a variety of statutes and first by the statute westminster two thirteen edward the first c thirty eight none shall pass on juries in assizes within the county but such as may dispend twenty shillings by the year end at the least which is increased to forty shillings by the statute twenty one edward the first s t one and two henry the fifth s t two c three this was doubled by the statute twenty seven elizabeth c six which requires in every such case the jurors to have a state of freehold to the yearly value of four pounds at the least but the value of money at that time decreasing very considerably this qualification was raised by the statute sixteen and seventeen charles the second c three to twenty pounds per annum which being only a temporary act for three years was suffered to expire without renewal to the great debasement of juries however by the statute four and five william and mary c twenty four it was again raised to ten pounds per annum in england and six pounds in wales of freehold lands or copyhold which is the first time that copyholders as such were admitted to serve upon juries in any of the king's courts though they had before been admitted to serve in some of the sheriff's courts by statutes one richard the third c four and nine henry the eighth c thirteen and lastly by statute three george the second c twenty five any leaseholder for the term of five hundred years absolute or for any term determinable upon life or lives of the clear yearly value of twenty pounds per annum over and above the rent reserved is qualified to serve upon juries when the jury is de mediatate linguae that is one moiety of the english tongue or nation and the other of any foreign one no want of land shall be cause of challenge to the alien for as he is incapable to hold any this would totally defeat the privilege Three jurors may be challenged propter affectum for suspicion of bias or partiality this may be either a principal challenge or to the favor a principal challenge is such where the cause assigned carries with it prima facie evident marks of suspicion either of malice or favor as that a juror is kin to either party within the ninth degree that he has been arbitrator on either side that he has an interest in the cause that there is an action depending between him and the party that he has taken money for his verdict that he has formerly been a juror in the same cause that he is the party's master servant counsellor steward or attorney or of the same society or corporation with him all these are principal causes of challenge which if true cannot be overruled for jurors must be omni exceptione maiores challenges to the favor are where the party hath no principal challenge but objects only some probable circumstances of suspicion as acquaintance and the like the validity of which must be left to the determination of triers whose office it is to decide whether the juror be favorable or unfavorable the triers in case the first man called be challenged are two indifferent persons named by the court and if they try one man and find him indifferent he shall be sworn and then he and the two triers shall try the next and when another is found indifferent and sworn the two triers shall be superseded and the first two sworn on the jury shall try the rest four challenges propter delictum are for some crime or misdemeanor that affects the juror's credit and renders him infamous as for a conviction of treason felony perjury or conspiracy or if he hath received judgment of the pillory trumbull or the like 
or to be branded, whipped, or stigmatized, or if he be outlawed, or excommunicated, or hath been attainted a false verdict, premonary, or forgery, or lastly, if he hath proved recreant when champion in the trial by battle, and thereby hath lost his liberum legem. A juror may be himself examined on oath of wadir veritatum dicere, with regard to the three former of these causes of challenge, which are not to his dishonor, but not with regard to this head of challenge, propter delectum, which would be to make him either forswear or accuse himself if guilty. Besides these challenges, which are exceptions against the fitness of jurors, and whereby they may be excluded from serving, there are also other causes to be made use of by the jurors themselves which are matter of exemption, whereby the service is excused and not excluded. As by statute Westminster 2, 13, Edward I, C. 38, sick and decrepit persons, persons not comorant in the county, and men above seventy years old, and by the statute of 7 and 8, William III, C. 32, infants under 21. This exemption is also extended by diverse statutes, customs, and charters to physicians and other medical persons, counsel, attorneys, officers of the courts, and the like, all of whom, if impaneled, must show their special exemption. Clergymen are also usually excused, out of favor and respect to their function. But if they are seized of lands and tenements, they are in strictness liable to be impaneled in respect of their lay fees unless they be in the service of the king or some bishop, in obsequio domine regis vel alecujus episcopi. If by means of challenges or other cause a sufficient number of unexceptional jurors doth not appear at the trial, either party may pray a tales. A tales is a supply of such men as are summoned upon the first panel in order to make up the deficiency. For this purpose, a writ of decem tales, octo tales, and the like was used to be issued by the sheriff at common law and must be still so done at a trial at bar if the jurors make default. But at the Assizes or Nisi Prius, by virtue of the statute 35 Henry VIII C6 and other subsequent statutes, the judge is empowered at the prayer of either party to award a tales de circumstantibus of persons present in court to be joined to the other jurors to try the cause, who are liable, however, to the same challenges as the principal jurors. This is usually done till the legal number of twelve be completed in which patriarchal and apostolical number Sir Edward Coke hath discovered abundance of mystery. When a sufficient number of persons impaneled, or talesmen appear, they are then separately sworn, and well and truly to try the issue between the parties and a true verdict to give according to the evidence, and hence they are denominated the jury, jurata, and jurors, juratores. We may here again observe, and observing we cannot but admire, how scrupulously delicate and how impartially just the law of England approves itself in the constitution and frame of a tribunal, thus excellently contrived for the test and investigation of truth, which appears most remarkably, one, in the avoiding of frauds and secret management by electing the twelve jurors out of the whole panel by lot, two, in its caution against all partiality and bias by quashing the whole panel or array if the officer returning is suspected to be other than indifferent, and repelling particular jurors if probable cause be shown of malice or favor to either party. The prodigious multitude of exceptions or challenges allowed to jurors, who are the judges of fact, amounts nearly to the same thing as was practiced in the Roman Republic before she lost her liberty, that the select judges should be appointed by the praetor with mutual consent of the parties, or, as Tully expresses it, ne minum valuerent maiores nostri, non modo de existimatione cujusquam, sed ne pecuniaria quidem dere minima, esse judicem, 
nisi qui inter adversarias convenisset. Indeed, these selecte judices bore in many respects a remarkable resemblance to our juries, for they were first returned by the praetor, de decoria centoria conscribuntor. Then their names were drawn by lot, till a certain number was completed. In urnam sortito mituntor, ut de pluribus necessarios numerus confici poset. Then the parties were allowed their challenges. Post urnum permetitor accusatore, acereo, ute ex ilio numero regicant quos putaverent sibi aut inimicos aut ex aliqua re incommodos fore. Next they struck what we call a tales, rejectione celebrata, in eorum locum qui rejecti fuerunt, sub sortiobator praetor alios, quibus ille dugitum legitimus numerus compleretor. Lastly, the judges, like our jury, were sworn, his perfectus, jurabent in legis judicis, ut abstricti religione judicarent. The jury are now ready to hear the merits, and to fix their attention the closer to the facts which they are impaneled and sworn to try, the pleadings are open to them by counsel on that side which holds the affirmative of the question in issue. For the issue is said to lie, and proof is always first required upon that side which affirms the matter in question in which our law agrees with the civil. Ei incumbit probatio, qui dicit non qui negat, cum pererum naturum factum negantis probatio nulla sit. The opening counsel briefly informs them what has been transacted in the court above, the parties, the nature of the action, the declaration, the plea, replication, and other proceedings, and lastly, upon what point the issue is joined, which is there sent down to be determined. Instead of which formally, the whole record and process of the pleadings was read to them in English by the court, and the matter in issue clearly explained to their capacities. The nature of the case, and the evidence intended to be produced, are next laid before them by counsel also on the same side. And when their evidence has gone through, the advocate on the other side opens the adverse case and supports it by evidence, and then the party which began is heard by way of reply. End of chapter 23, part 2. Chapter 23, part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England. Book 3 by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Trial by Jury, Part 3. The nature of my present design will not permit me to enter into the numberless niceties and distinctions of what is or is not legal evidence to a jury. I shall only therefore select a few of the general heads and leading maxims relative to this point, together with some observations on the manner of giving evidence. And first, Evidence signifies that which demonstrates, makes clear, or ascertains the truth of the very fact or point in issue, either on the one side or on the other, and no evidence ought to be admitted to any other point. Therefore, upon an action of debt, when the defendant denies his bond by the plea of non est factum, and the issue is whether it be the defendant's deed or no, he cannot give a release of this bond in evidence, for that does not destroy the bond, and therefore does not prove the issue of which he has chosen to rely upon, viz. that the bond has no existence. Again, evidence in the trial by jury is of two kinds, either that which is given in proof, or that which the jury may receive by their own private knowledge. The former, or proofs, to which in common speech the name of evidence is usually confined, are either written or parole, that is, by word of mouth. 
written proofs or evidence are 1. Records and 2. Ancient deeds of 30 years standing which prove themselves, but 3. Modern deeds and 4. Other writings must be attested and verified by parole evidence of witnesses. And the one general rule that runs through all the doctrine of trials is this, that the best evidence the nature of the case will admit of shall always be required, if possible, to be had. But if not possible, then the best evidence that can be had shall be allowed. For if it be found that there is any better evidence existing than is produced, the very not producing it is a presumption that it would have detected some falsehood that at present is concealed. Thus, in order to prove a lease for years, nothing else shall be admitted but the very deed of lease itself, if in being. But if that be positively proved to be burnt or destroyed, not relying on any loose negative as that it cannot be found or the like, then an attested copy may be produced or parole evidence be given of its contents. So no evidence of a discourse with another will be admitted, but the man himself must be produced. Yet in some cases, as in proof of any general customs or matters of common tradition or repute, the courts admit of hearsay evidence or an account of what persons deceased have declared in their lifetime, but such evidence will not be received of any particular facts. So, too, books of account or shop books are not allowed of themselves to be given in evidence for the owner, but a servant who made the entry may have recourse to them to refresh his memory, and if such servant, who was accustomed to make those entries, be dead, and his hand be proved, the book may be read in evidence. For, as tradesmen are often under a necessity of giving credit without any note or writing, this is therefore, when accompanied with such other collateral proofs of fairness and regularity, the best evidence that can then be produced. However, this dangerous species of evidence is not carried so far in England as abroad where a man's own books of accounts, by a distortion of the civil law, which seems to have meant the same thing as is practiced with us, with the supplatory oath of the merchant, amount at all times to full proof. But as this kind of evidence, even thus regulated, would be much too hard upon the buyer at any long distance of time, the Statute 7, James I, C. 12, the penners of which seem to have imagined that the books of themselves were evidence at common law, confines this species of proof to such transactions as have happened within one year before the action brought, unless between merchant and merchant in the usual course of trade. For accounts of so recent a date, if erroneous, may more easily be unraveled and adjusted. With regard to parole evidence or witnesses, it must first be remembered that there is a process to bring them in by writ of subpoena ad testificiandum, which commands them, laying aside all pretenses and excuses, to appear at the trial on pain of one hundred pounds to be forfeited to the king, to which the statute 5 Elizabeth C. 9 has added a penalty of ten pounds to the party aggrieved and damages equivalent to the loss sustained by want of his evidence. But no witness, unless his reasonable expenses be tendered him, is bound to appear at all, nor, if he appears, is he bound to give evidence till such charges are actually paid him, except he resides within the bills of mortality and is summoned to give evidence within the same. This compulsory process to bring in unwilling witnesses and the additional terrors of an attachment in case of disobedience are of excellent use in the thorough investigation of truth, and upon the same principle in the Athenian courts, the witnesses who were summoned to attend the trial had their choice of three things, either to swear to the truth of the fact in question, to deny or abjure it, or else to pay a fine of a thousand drachmas. All witnesses that have the use of their reason are to be received and examined except such as are infamous or such as are interested in the event of the cause, 
all others are competent witnesses, though the jury from other circumstances will judge of their credibility. Infamous persons are such as may be challenged as jurors propter delictum, and therefore never shall be admitted to give evidence to inform that jury with whom they were too scandalous to associate. Interested witnesses may be examined upon a voir dire if suspected to be secretly concerned in the event, or their interest may be proved in court. Which last is the only method of supporting an objection to the former class, for no man is to be examined to prove his own infamy, and no counsel, attorney, or other person entrusted with the secrets of the cause by the party himself shall be compelled, or perhaps allowed, to give evidence of such conversation or matters of privacy as came to his knowledge by virtue of such trust and confidence but he may be examined as to mere matters of fact, as the execution of a deed or the like, which might have come to his knowledge without being entrusted in the cause. One witness, if credible, is sufficient evidence to a jury of any single fact, though undoubtedly the concurrence of two or more corroborates the proof. Yet our law considers that there are many transactions to which only one person is privy, and therefore does not always demand the testimony of two, as the civil law universally requires. Unius responsio testis omnio non odiator. To extricate itself out of which absurdity the modern practice of the civil law courts has plunged itself into another. For as they do not allow a less number than two witnesses to be a plena probatio, they call the testimony of one though never so clear and positive, semi plena probatio only, on which no sentence can be founded. To make up, therefore, the necessary complement of witnesses, when they have one only to any single fact, they admit the party himself, plaintiff or defendant, to be examined on his own behalf and administer to him what is called a supplatory oath, and, if his evidence happens to be in his own favor, this immediately converts the half-proof into a whole one. By this ingenious device satisfying at once the forms of the Roman law, and acknowledging the superior reasonableness of the law of England, which permits one witness to be sufficient where no more are to be had, and to avoid all temptations of perjury, lays it down as an invariable rule, that nemo testis esse debet in propria causa. Positive proof is always required where from the nature of the case it appears it might possibly have been had. But next to positive proof, circumstantial evidence or the doctrine of presumptions must take place. For when the fact itself cannot be demonstratively evinced, that which comes nearest to the proof of the fact is proof of such circumstances which either necessarily or usually attend such facts, and these are called presumptions, which are only to be relied upon till the contrary be actually proved. Stabitor praesumptione donec probetor in contrarium. Violent presumption is many times equal to full proof, for there those circumstances appear which necessarily attend the fact, as if a landlord sues for rent due at Michaelmas 1754, and the tenant cannot prove the payment, but produces an acquittance for rent due at a subsequent time in full of all demands, this is a violent presumption of his having paid the former rent, and is equivalent to full proof, for though the actual payment is not proved, Yet the acquittance in full of all demands is proved, which could not be without such payment, and it therefore induces so forcible a presumption that no proof shall be admitted to the contrary. Probable presumption arising from such circumstances as usually attend the fact hath also its due weight, as if in a suit for rent due 1754 the tenant proves the payment of the rent due in 1755. This will prevail to exonerate the tenant unless it be clearly shown that the rent of 1754 was retained for some special reason or that there was some fraud or mistake. 
for otherwise it will be presumed to have been paid before that in 1755, as it is most usual to receive first the rents of longest standing. Light or rash presumptions have no weight or validity at all. The oath administered to the witness is not only that what he deposes shall be true, but that he shall also depose the whole truth, so that he is not to conceal any part of what he knows, whether interrogated particularly to that point or not. And all this evidence is to be given in open court, in the presence of the parties, their attorneys, the counsel, and all bystanders, and before the judge and jury each party having liberty to accept to its competency which exceptions are publicly stated and by the judge are openly and publicly allowed or disallowed in the face of the country which must curb any secret bias or partiality that might arise in his own breast and if either in his directions or decisions he misstates the law by ignorance inadvertence or design the counsel on either side may require him to publicly seal a bill of exceptions, stating the point wherein he is supposed to err, and this he is obliged to seal by statute Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C. 31, or, if he refuses to do so, the party may have a compulsory writ against him, commanding him to seal it, if the fact alleged be truly stated and if he returns that the fact is untruly stated when the case is otherwise an action will lie against him for making a false return this bill of exceptions is in the nature of an appeal examinable not in the court out of which the record issues for the trial at nisi prius but in the next immediate superior court upon a writ of error after judgment given in the court below but a demurrer to evidence shall be determined by the court out of which the record is sent. This happens where a record or other matter is produced in evidence concerning the legal consequences of which there arises a doubt in law, in which case the adverse party may, if he pleases, demur to the whole evidence which admits the truth of every fact that has been alleged, but denies the sufficiency of them all in point of law to maintain or overthrow the issue, which draws the question of law from the cognizance of the jury to be decided, as it ought, by the court. But neither these demurrers to the evidence nor the bills of exceptions are at present so much in use as formerly, since the more frequent extension of the discretionary powers of the court in granting a new trial, which is now very commonly had for the misdirection of the judge at Nisi Prius. This open examination of witnesses, viva voce, in the presence of all mankind is much more conducive to the clearing up of truth than the private and secret examination taken down in writing before an officer or his clerk in the ecclesiastical courts and all others that have borrowed their practice from the civil law where a witness may frequently depose that in private which he will be ashamed to testify in a public and solemn tribunal there an artful or careless scribe may make a witness speak what he never meant by dressing up his depositions in his own forms and language but he is here at liberty to correct and explain his meaning if misunderstood which he can never do after a written deposition is once taken besides the occasional questions of the judge the jury and the counsel propounded to the witness on a sudden will sift out the truth much better than a formal set of interrogatories previously penned and settled, and the confronting of adverse witnesses is also another opportunity of obtaining a clear discovery which can never be had upon any other method of trial. Nor is the presence of the judge during the examination a matter of small importance, for besides the respect and awe with which his presence will naturally inspire the witness, he is able by use and experience to keep the evidence from wandering from the point in issue. In short, by this method of examination, and this only, the persons who are to decide upon the evidence have an opportunity of observing the quality, age, education, understanding, behavior, and inclinations of the witness, 
in which points all persons must appear alike when their depositions are reduced to writing and read to the judge in the absence of those who made them and yet as much may be frequently collected from the manner in which the evidence is delivered as from the matter of it these are a few of the advantages attending this the english way of giving testimony ore tenus which was also indeed familiar among the ancient romans as may be collected from quintilian who lays down very good instructions for examining and cross-examining witnesses viva voce and this or somewhat like it was continued as low as the time of hadrian but the civil law as it is now modelled rejects all public examination of witnesses as to such evidence as the jury may have in their own consciences by their private knowledge of facts it was an ancient doctrine that this had as much right to sway their judgment as the written or parole evidence which is delivered in court and therefore it hath often been held that though no proofs be produced on either side yet the jury might bring in a verdict for the oath of the jurors to find according to their evidence was construed to be to do it according to the best of their own knowledge which construction was probably made out of tenderness to juries that they might escape the heavy penalties of an attaint in case they could show by an additional proof that their verdict was agreeable to the truth though not according to the evidence produced with which additional proof the law presumed they were privately acquainted though it did not appear in court but this doctrine was gradually exploded when attaints began to be disused and new trials introduced in their stead for it is quite incompatible with the grounds upon which such new trials are every day awarded viz that the verdict was given without or contrary to evidence and therefore together with new trials the practice seems to have been first introduced which now universally obtains that if a juror knows anything of the matter in issue he may be sworn as a witness and give his evidence publicly in court when the evidence is gone through on both sides the judge in the presence of the parties the counsel and all others sums up the whole to the jury omitting all superfluous circumstances observing wherein the main question and principal issue lies stating what evidence has been given to support it with such remarks as he thinks necessary for their direction and giving them his opinion in matters of law arising upon that evidence the jury after the proofs are summed up unless the case be very clear withdraw from the bar to consider their verdict and in order to avoid intemperance and causeless delay are to be kept without meat drink fire or candle unless by special permission of the judge till they are unanimously agreed a method of accelerating unanimity not wholly unknown in other constitutions of europe and in matters of great concern for by the golden bull of the empire if after the congress is opened the electors delay the election of a king of the romans for thirty days they shall be fed only with bread and water till the same is accomplished but if our juries eat or drink at all or have any eatables about them without consent of the court and before verdict it is finable and if they do so at his charge for whom they afterwards find it will set aside the verdict also if they speak with either of the parties or their agents after they are gone from the bar or if they receive any fresh evidence in private or if to prevent disputes they cast lots for whom they shall find any of these circumstances will entirely vitiate the verdict and it has been held that if the jurors do not agree in their verdict before the judges are about to leave the town though they are not to be threatened or imprisoned the judges are not bound to wait for them but may carry them round the circuit from town to town in a cart this necessity of a total unanimity seems to be peculiar of our own constitution or at least in the nemda or jury of the ancient goths there was required even in criminal cases only the consent of the major part and in case of inequality the defendant was held to be acquitted 
When they are all unanimously agreed, the jury return back to the bar, and before they deliver the verdict, the plaintiff is bound to appear in court by himself, attorney, or counsel in order to answer the immersement to which, by the old law, he is liable, as has been formally mentioned, in case he fails in his suit as a punishment for his false claim. To be immersed, or a mercy, is to be at the king's mercy with regard to the fine to be imposed. In misericordia domini regis pro falso clamore suo. The immersement is disused, but the form still continues, and if the plaintiff does not appear, no verdict can be given, but the plaintiff is said to be non-suit, non sequitur clamorum suum. Therefore, it is usual for a plaintiff, when he or his counsel perceives that he has not given evidence sufficient to maintain his issue, to be voluntarily non-suited or withdraw himself, whereupon the crier is ordered to call the plaintiff, and if neither he nor anybody for him appears he is non-suited, the jurors are discharged, the action is at an end, and the defendant shall recover his costs. The reason of this practice is that a non-suit is more eligible for the plaintiff than a verdict against him, for after a non-suit, which is only a default, he may commence the same suit again for the same cause of action, but after a verdict had and a judgment consequent thereupon, he is forever barred from attacking the defendant upon the same ground of complaint. But in case the plaintiff appears, the jury, by their foreman, deliver their verdict. End of chapter 23, part 3. Chapter 23, part 4 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of the Trial by Jury, Part 4. A Verdict, Vere Dictum, is either privy or public. A privy verdict is when the judge hath left or adjourned the court, and the jury, being agreed, in order to be delivered from their confinement, obtain leave to give their verdict privily to the judge out of court which privy verdict is of no force unless afterwards affirmed by a public verdict given openly in court, wherein the jury may, if they please, vary from their privy verdict, so that the privy verdict is indeed a mere nullity, and yet it is a dangerous practice allowing time for the parties to tamper with the jury, and therefore very seldom indulged. But the only effectual and legal verdict is the public verdict, in which they openly declare to have found the issue for the plaintiff or for the defendant, and if for the plaintiff they assess the damages also sustained by the plaintiff in consequence of the injury upon which the action is brought. Sometimes, if there arises in the case any difficult matter of law, the jury for the sake of better information and to avoid the danger of having their verdict detainted will find a special verdict which is grounded on the statute Westminster 2, 13, Edward I, C. 30, S. 2. And herein they state the naked facts as they find them to be proved, and pray the advice of the court thereon, concluding conditionally, that if upon the whole matter the court shall be of opinion that the plaintiff had cause of action, they then find for the plaintiff, if otherwise, then for the defendant. This is entered at length on the record, and afterwards argued and determined in the court at Westminster from whence the issue came to be tried. Another method of finding a species of special verdict is when the jury find a verdict generally for the plaintiff, but subject nevertheless to the opinion of the judge or the court above on a special case stated by the counsel on both sides with regard to a matter of law which has this advantage over a special verdict, that it is attended with much less expense and obtains a much speedier decision. The postia, of which in the next chapter, 
being stayed in the hands of the officer of Nisi Prius till the question is determined, and the verdict is then entered for the plaintiff or defendant as the case may happen. But, as nothing appears upon the record but the general verdict, the parties are precluded hereby from the benefit of a writ of error if dissatisfied with the judgment of the court or judge upon the point of law which makes it a thing to be wished that a method could be devised of either lessening the expense of special verdicts or else of entering the case at length upon the postia. But in both these instances the jury may, if they think proper, take upon themselves to determine at their own hazard the complicated question of fact and law, and without either special verdict or special case, may find a verdict absolutely either for the plaintiff or defendant. When the jury have delivered in their verdict, and it is recorded in court, they are then discharged, and so ends the trial by jury, a trial which besides the other vast advantages which we have occasionally observed in its progress, is also as expeditious and cheap as it is convenient, equitable, and certain for a commission out of chancery or the civil courts for examining witnesses in one cause will frequently last as long and of course be full as expensive as the trial of a hundred issues at nisi prius and yet the fact cannot be determined by such commissioners at all no not till the depositions are published and read at the hearing of the cause in court Upon these accounts, the trial by jury ever has been, and I trust ever will be, looked upon as the glory of the English law. And if it has so great an advantage over others in regulating civil property, how much must that advantage be heightened when it is applied to criminal cases? But this we must refer to the ensuing book of these commentaries, only observing for the present that it is the most transcendent privilege which any subject can enjoy, or with for, that he cannot be affected either in his property, his liberty, or his person, but by the unanimous consent of twelve of his neighbors and equals. A constitution that I may venture to affirm has, under providence, secured the just liberties of this nation for a long succession of ages. And therefore, a celebrated French writer, who concludes that because Rome, Sparta, and Carthage have lost their liberties, therefore those of England must in time perish, should have recollected that Rome, Sparta, and Carthage were strangers to the trial by jury. Great as this eulogium may seem, it is no more than this admirable constitution, when traced to its principles, will be found in sober reason to deserve. The impartial administration of justice, which secures both our persons and our properties, is the great end of civil society. But if that be entirely entrusted to the magistracy, a select body of men, and those generally selected by the prince or such as enjoy the highest offices in the state, their decisions, in spite of their own natural integrity, will have frequently an involuntary bias towards those of their own rank and dignity. It is not to be expected from human nature that the few should always be attentive to the interests and good of the many. On the other hand, if the power of judicature were placed at random in the hands of the multitude, their decisions would be wild and capricious, and a new rule of action would be every day established in our courts. It is wisely therefore ordered that the principles and axioms of law which are general propositions flowing from abstracted reason and not accommodated to times or to men should be deposited in the breasts of judges to be occasionally applied to such facts as come properly ascertained before them. For here partiality can have little scope. The law is well known and is the same for all ranks and degrees. It follows as a regular conclusion from the premises of fact pre-established. But in settling and adjusting a question of fact, when entrusted to any single magistrate, partiality and injustice have an ample field to range in, either by boldly asserting that to be proved which is not so, 
or more artfully by suppressing some circumstances, stretching and warping others, and distinguishing away the remainder. Here, therefore, a competent number of sensible and upright jurymen, chosen by lot from among those of the middle rank, will be found the best investigators of truth and the surest guardians of public justice. For the most powerful individual in the state will be cautious of committing any flagrant invasion of another's right when he knows that the fact of his oppression must be examined and decided by twelve indifferent men not appointed till the hour of trial, and that, when once the fact is ascertained, the law must of course redress it. This, therefore, preserves in the hands of the people that share which they ought to have in the administration of public justice, and prevents the encroachments of the more powerful and wealthy citizens. Every new tribunal, erected for the decision of facts without the intervention of a jury, whether composed of justices of the peace, commissioners of the revenue, judges of a court of conscience, or any other standing magistrates, is a step towards establishing aristocracy, the most oppressive of absolute governments. The feudal system which, for the sake of military subordination, pursued an aristocratical plan in all its arrangements of property, had been intolerable in times of peace had it not been wisely counterpoised by that privilege so universally diffused through every part of it the trial by the feudal peers. And in every country on the continent, as the trial by the peers has been gradually disused, so the nobles have increased in power, till the state has been torn to pieces by rival factions and oligarchy, in effect, has been established, though under the shadow of regal government unless where the miserable commons have taken shelter under absolute monarchy as the lighter evil of the two. And particularly, it is a circumstance well worthy of an Englishman's observation that in Sweden the trial by jury, that bulwark of northern liberty, which continued in its full vigor so lately as the middle of the last century, is now fallen into disuse, and that there, Though the regal power is in no country so closely limited, yet the liberties of the commons are extinguished, and the government is degenerated into a mere aristocracy. It is, therefore, upon the whole, a duty which every man owes to his country, his friends, his posterity, and himself, to maintain to the utmost of his power this valuable constitution in all its rights to restore it to its ancient dignity, if at all impaired by the different value of property, or otherwise deviated from its first institution, to amend it wherever it is defective, and above all to guard with most jealous circumspection against the introduction of new and arbitrary methods of trial which, under a variety of plausible pretenses, may in time imperceptibly undermine this best preservative of English liberty. Yet, after all, it must be owned that the best and most effectual method to preserve and extend the trial by jury in practice would be by endeavoring to remove all the defects as well as to improve the advantages incident to this mode of inquiry. If justice is not done to the entire satisfaction of the people in this method of deciding facts, in spite of all encomiums and panegyrics on trials at the common law, they will resort in search of that justice to another tribunal, though more dilatory, though more expensive, though more arbitrary in its frame and constitution. If justice is not done to the crown by the verdict of a jury, the necessities of the public revenue will call for the erection of summary tribunals. The principal defects seem to be, one, the want of a complete discovery by the oath of the parties. This, each of them, is now entitled to have, by going through the expense and circuity of a court of equity, and therefore it is sometimes had by consent, even in the courts of law. How far such a mode of compulsive examination is agreeable to the rights of mankind and ought to be introduced in any country may be a matter of curious discussion, but is foreign to our present inquiries. 
It has long been introduced and established in our courts of equity, not to mention the civil law courts, and it seems the height of judicial absurdity that in the same cause between the same parties, in the examination of the same facts, a discovery by the oath of the parties should be permitted on one side of Westminster Hall and denied on the other, or that the judges of one and the same court should be bound by law to reject such a species of evidence if attempted on a trial at bar but when sitting the next day as a court of equity should be obliged to hear such examination read and to found their decrees upon it. In short, common reason will tell us that in the same country governed by the same laws, such a mode of inquiry should be universally admitted or else universally rejected. 2. A second defect is of a nature somewhat similar to the first. The want of a compulsive power for the production of books and papers belonging to the parties. In the hands of third persons, they can generally be obtained by rule of court or by adding a clause of requisition to the writ of subpoena, which is then called subpoena duetus tecum. But in mercantile transactions especially, the sight of the parties' own books is frequently decisive such, for instance, as the day-book of a trader, where the transaction must be recently entered as really understood at the time, though subsequent events may tempt him to give it a different color. And as this evidence may be finally obtained and produced on a trial at law, by the circuitous course of filing a bill in equity, the want of an original power for the same purposes in the courts of law is liable to the same observations as were made on the preceding article. 3. Another want is that of powers to examine witnesses abroad, and to receive their depositions in writing where the witnesses reside, and especially when the cause of action arises in a foreign country to which may be added the power of examining witnesses that are aged or going abroad upon interrogatories de bene esse, to be read in evidence if the trial should be deferred till after their death or departure, but otherwise to be totally suppressed. Both these are now very frequently affected by mutual consent if the parties are open and candid and they may also be done indirectly at any time through the channel of a court of equity. But such a practice has never yet been directly adopted as the rule of a court of law. 4. The administration of justice should not only be chaste, but, like Caesar's wife, should not even be suspected. A jury coming from the neighborhood is in some respects a great advantage, but is often liable to strong objections especially in small jurisdictions, as in cities which are countries of themselves, and such where assizes are but seldom holden, or where the question in dispute has an extensive local tendency, where a cry has been raised and the passions of the multitude been inflamed, or where one of the parties is popular and the other a stranger or obnoxious. It is true that if a whole county is interested in the question to be tried, the trial by the rule of law must be in some adjoining county. But as there may be the strict interest so minute as not to occasion any bias, so there may be the strongest bias where the whole county cannot be said to have any pecuniary interest. In all these cases, to summon a jury laboring under local prejudices is laying a snare for their consciences, and though they should have virtue and vigor of mind sufficient to keep them upright, the parties will grow suspicious and resort under various pretenses to another mode of trial. The courts of law will therefore, in transitory actions, very often change the venue or county wherein the cause is to be tried but in local actions, though they sometimes do it indirectly and by mutual consent, yet to effect it directly and absolutely, the parties are driven to the delay and expense of a court of equity, where, upon making out a proper case, it is done upon the ground of being necessary to a fair, impartial, and satisfactory trial. The locality of trial required by the common law seems a consequence of the ancient locality of jurisdiction. 
All over the world, actions transitory follow the person of the defendant. Territorial suits must be discussed in the territorial tribunal. I may sue a Frenchman here for a debt contracted abroad, but lands lying in France must be sued for there, and English lands must be sued for in the Kingdom of England. Formerly, they were usually demanded only in the court baron of the manor, where the steward could summon no jurors but such as were the tenants of the lord. When the cause was removed to the hundred court, as seems to have been the course in the Saxon times, the lord of the hundred had a farther power to convoke the inhabitants of different villes to form a jury, observing probably always to intermix among them a stated number of tenants of that manner wherein the dispute arose. When afterwards it came to the county court, the great tribunal of Saxon justice, the sheriff had wider authority and could impanel a jury from the men of his county at large, but was obliged, as a mark of the original locality of the cause, to return a competent number of hundreders, omitting the inferior distinction, if indeed it ever existed. And when at length, after the conquest, the king's justiciars drew the cognizance of the cause from the county court, though they could have summoned a jury from any part of the kingdom, yet they chose to take the cause as they found it, with all its local appendages, triable by a stated number of hundred oars, mixed with other freeholders of the county. The restriction as to hundred oars hath gradually worn away, and at length entirely vanished. That of counties still remains for many beneficial purposes, but as the king's courts have a jurisdiction coextensive with the kingdom, there surely can be no impropriety in departing from the general rule when the great ends of justice warrant and require an exception. I have ventured to mark these defects that the just panegyric which I have given on the trial by jury might appear to be the result of sober reflection and not of enthusiasm or prejudice. But should they, after all, continue unremedied and unsupplied, still, with all its imperfections, I trust that this mode of decision will be found the best criterion for investigating the truth of facts that was ever established in any country. End of chapter 23, part 4「Chapter twenty four Part One of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book Three by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of Judgment and Its Incidents, Part One. In the following chapter we are to consider the transactions in a cause next immediately subsequent to arguing the demurrer or trial of the issue. If the issue be an issue of fact, and upon trial by any of the methods mentioned in the two preceding chapters, it be found for either the plaintiff or defendant or specially, or if the plaintiff makes default or is non-suit, or whatever, in short, is done subsequent to the joining of issue and awarding the trial, it is entered on record and is called a postia, the substance of which is that postia, afterwards, the said plaintiff and defendant appeared by their attorneys at the place of trial, and a jury being sworn found such a verdict, or that the plaintiff after the jury sworn made default and did not prosecute his suit or as the case may happen. This is added to the roll which is now returned to the court from which it was sent, and the history of the cause from the time it was carried out is thus continued by the postia. Next follows, sixthly, the judgment of the court upon what has previously passed, both the matter of law and the matter of fact being now fully weighed and adjusted. Judgment may, however, for certain causes be suspended or finally arrested, for it cannot be entered till the next term after trial had, and that upon notice to the other party. 
so that if any defect of justice happened at the trial by surprise, inadvertence, or misconduct, the party may have relief in the court above by obtaining a new trial, or if, notwithstanding the issue of fact be regularly decided, it appears the complaint was either not actionable in itself or not made with sufficient precision and accuracy, the party may supersede it by arresting or staying the judgment. 1. Causes of suspending the judgment by granting a new trial are at present wholly extrinsic, arising from matter foreign to or dehors the record. Of this sort are want of notice of trial, or any flagrant misbehavior of the party prevailing towards the jury which may have influenced their verdict, or any gross misbehavior of the jury among themselves. Also, if it appears by the judge's report certified to the court that the jury have brought in a verdict without or contrary to evidence so that he is reasonably dissatisfied therewith, or if they have given exorbitant damages, or if the judge himself has misdirected the jury so that they found an unjustifiable verdict, for these and other reasons of the like kind, it is the practice of the court to award a new or second trial. But if two juries agree in the same or a similar verdict, a third trial is seldom awarded, for the law will not readily suppose that the verdict of any one subsequent jury can countervail the oaths of two preceding ones. The exertion of these superintendent powers of the king's courts in setting aside the verdict of a jury and granting a new trial on account of misbehavior in the jurors is of a date extremely ancient. There are instances in the yearbooks of the reigns of Edward III, Henry IV, and Henry VII of judgments being stayed even after a trial at bar and new veneers awarded because the jury had eat and drank without consent of the judge, and because the plaintiff had privately given a paper to a juryman before he was sworn. And upon these the Chief Justice Glynn in 1655 grounded the first precedent that is reported in our books for granting a new trial upon account of excessive damages given by a jury, apprehending with reason that notorious partiality in the jurors was a principal species of misbehavior. And a few years before, a practice took rise in the common pleas of granting new trials upon the mere certificate of the judge, unfortified by any report of the evidence that the verdict had passed against his opinion. Though Justice Roll, who allowed of new trials in case of misbehavior, surprise, or fraud, or if the verdict was notoriously contrary to the evidence, refused to adopt that practice in the Court of King's Bench. And at that time it was clearly held for law that whatever matter was of force to avoid a verdict ought to be returned upon the postia and not merely surmised to the court lest posterity should wonder why a new venere was awarded without any sufficient reason appearing on the record. But very early in the reign of Charles II, new trials were granted upon affidavits, and the former strictness of the courts of law in respect of new trials having driven many parties into equity to be relieved from oppressive verdicts, they are now more liberal in granting them, the maxim at present adopted being this, that, in all cases of moment, where justice is not done upon one trial, the injured party is entitled to another. Formerly, the only remedy for reversal of a verdict unduly given was by writ of attaint, of which we shall speak in the next chapter, and which is at least as old as the institution of the Grand Assize by Henry II in lieu of the Norman trial by battle. Such a sanction was probably thought necessary when, instead of appealing to Providence for the decision of a dubious right, it was referred to the oath of fallible or perhaps corrupted men. Our ancestors saw that a jury might give an erroneous verdict, and if they did, that it ought not finally to conclude the question in the first instance, but the remedy which they provided shows the ignorance and ferocity of the times and the simplicity of the points then usually litigated in courts of justice. 
They supposed that the law being told to the jury by the judge, the proof of fact must be always so clear that if they found the wrong verdict, they must be willfully corrupted and perjured. Whereas a juror may find a just verdict from unrighteous motives, which can only be known to the great searcher of hearts, and he may, on the contrary, find the verdict very manifestly wrong without any bad motive at all, from inexperience in business, incapacity, misapprehension, inattention to circumstances, and a thousand other innocent causes. But such a remedy as this laid the injured party under an insufferable hardship by making a conviction of the jurors for perjury the condition of his redress. The judges saw this, and very early, even for the misbehavior of jurymen, instead of prosecuting the writ of attaint, awarded a second trial. And subsequent resolutions for more than a century past have so extended the benefit of this remedy that the attaint is now as obsolete as the trial by battle which it succeeded, and we shall probably see the revival of the one as soon as the revival of the other. And here I cannot but again admire the wisdom of suffering time to bring perfection to new remedies more easy and beneficial to the subject, which by degrees from the experience and approbation of the people supersede the necessity or desire of using or continuing the old. If every verdict was final in the first instance, it would tend to destroy this valuable method of trial and would drive away all causes of consequence to be decided according to the forms of the imperial law upon depositions in writing, which might be reviewed in a course of appeal. Causes of great importance, titles to land, and large questions of commercial property come often to be tried by a jury merely upon the general issue. Where the facts are complicated and intricate, the evidence of great length and variety, and sometimes contradicting each other, and where the nature of the dispute very frequently introduces nice questions and subtleties of law. Either party may be surprised by a piece of evidence which, had he known of its production, he could have explained or answered, or may be puzzled by a legal doubt which a little recollection would have solved. In the hurry of a trial, the ablest judge may mistake the law and misdirect the jury. He may not be able so to state and range the evidence as to lay it clearly before them, nor to take off the artful impressions which have been made on their minds by learned and experienced advocates. The jury are to give their opinion instanter, that is, before they separate, eat or drink. And under these circumstances, the most intelligent and best-intentioned men may bring in a verdict which they themselves, upon cool deliberation, would wish to reverse. Next to doing right, the great object in the administration of public justice should be to give public satisfaction. If the verdict be liable to many objections and doubts in the opinion of his counsel, or even in the opinion of bystanders, no party would go away satisfied unless he had a prospect of reviewing it. Such doubts would with him be decisive. He would arraign the determination as manifestly unjust and abhor a tribunal which he imagined had done him an injury without a possibility of redress. Granting a new trial under proper regulations cures all these inconveniences and at the same time preserves entire and renders perfect that most excellent method of decision which is the glory of the English law. A new trial is a rehearing of the cause before another jury, but with as little prejudice to either party as if it had never been heard before. No advantage is taken of the form of verdict on the one side, or the rule of court for awarding such second trial on the other, and the subsequent verdict, though contrary to the first, imports no title of blame upon the former jury, who, had they possessed the same lights and advantages, would probably have altered their own opinion. The parties come better informed, the counsel better prepared, the law is more fully understood, the judge is more master of the subject, and nothing is now tried but the real merits of the case. A sufficient ground must, however, be laid before the court to satisfy them that it is necessary to justice that the cause should be farther considered. 
if the matter be such as did not or could not appear to the judge who presided at Nisi Prius, it is disclosed to the court by affidavit. If it arises from what passed at the trial, it is taken from the judge's information, who usually makes a special and minute report of the evidence. Counsel are heard on both sides to impeach or establish the verdict, and the court gives their reasons at large why a new examination ought or ought not to be allowed. The true import of the evidence is duly weighed, false colors are taken off, and all points of law which arose at the trial are, upon full deliberation, clearly explained and settled. Nor do the courts lend too easy an ear to every application for a review of the former verdict. They must be satisfied that there are strong probable grounds to suppose that the merits have not been fairly and fully discussed, and that the decision is not agreeable to the justice and truth of the case. A new trial is not granted where the value is too inconsiderable to merit a second examination. It is not granted upon nice and formal objections which do not go to the real merits. It is not granted in cases of strict right or sumum jus, where the rigorous exaction of the extreme legal justice is hardly reconcilable to conscience. Nor is it granted where the scales of evidence hang nearly equal. That which leans against the former verdict ought always very strongly to preponderate. In granting such farther trial, which is matter of sound discretion, the court has also an opportunity which it seldom fails to improve of supplying those defects in this mode of trial which were stated in the preceding chapter by laying the party applying under all such equitable terms as his antagonist shall desire and mutually offer to comply with, such as the discovery of some facts upon oath, the admission of others not intended to be litigated, the production of deeds, books, and papers, the examination of witnesses, infirm or going beyond the sea, and the like. And the delay and expense of this proceeding are so small and trifling that it never can be moved for to gain time or gratify humor. The motion must be made within the first four days of the next succeeding term, within which term it is usually heard and decided. And it is worthy observation how infinitely superior to all others the trial by jury approves itself, even in the very mode of its revision. In every other country of Europe, and in those of our own tribunals which conform themselves to the process of the civil law, the parties are at liberty, whenever they please, to appeal from day to day and from court to court upon questions merely of fact, which is a perpetual source of obstinate chicane, delay, and expensive litigation. With us, no new trial is allowed unless there be a manifest mistake and the subject matter be worthy of interposition. The party who thinks himself aggrieved may still, if he pleases, have recourse to his writ of attaint after judgment. In the course of the trial, he may demur to the evidence or tender a bill of exceptions. And if the first is totally laid aside and the other two very seldom put in practice, it is because long experience has shown that a motion for a second trial is the shortest, cheapest, and most effectual cure for all imperfections in the verdict, whether they arise from the mistakes of the parties themselves, of their counsel or attorneys, or even of the judge or jury. End of chapter 24, part 1. Chapter 24, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Judgment and Its Incidents, Part 2. 2. Arrests of judgment arise from intrinsic causes appearing upon the face of the record. Of this kind are first, where the declaration varies totally from the original writ, as where the writ is in debt or detinue, and the plaintiff declares an action on the case for an assumpsit, 
for the original writ out of chancery being the foundation and warrant of the whole proceeding in the common pleas, if the declaration does not pursue the nature of the writ, the court's authority totally fails. Also, secondly, where the verdict materially differs from the pleadings in issue thereon, as if in an action for words, it is laid in the declaration that the defendant said, the plaintiff is a bankrupt, and the verdict finds specially that he said, the plaintiff will be a bankrupt. Or thirdly, if the case laid in the declaration is not sufficient in point of law to found an action upon, and this is an invariable rule with regard to arrests of judgment upon matter of law, that whatever is alleged in an arrest of judgment must be such matter as would upon demurrer have been sufficient to overturn the action or plea. As if, on an action for slander in calling the plaintiff a Jew, the defendant denies the words and issue is joined thereon. Now if a verdict be found for the plaintiff that the words were actually spoken, whereby the fact is established, still the defendant may move in arrest of judgment, that to call a man a Jew is not actionable, and if the court be of that opinion, the judgment shall be arrested and never entered for the plaintiff. But the rule will not hold a converso, that everything that may be alleged as cause of demurrer will be good in arrest of judgment. For if a declaration or plea omits to state some particular circumstance without proving of which, at the trial, it is impossible to support the action or defense, this omission shall be aided by a verdict. As if, in an action of trespass, the declaration doth not allege that the trespass was committed on any certain day, or if the defendant justifies by prescribing for a right of common for his cattle, and does not plead that his cattle were levant and couchant on the land, though either of these defects might be good cause to demur to the declaration or plea, yet if the adverse party omits to take advantage of such omission in due time, but takes issue and has a verdict against him, these exceptions cannot after verdict be moved in arrest of judgment. For the verdict ascertains those facts which before the inaccuracy of the pleadings might be dubious, since the law will not suppose that a jury under the inspection of a judge would find a verdict for the plaintiff or defendant unless he had proved those circumstances without which his general allegation is defective. Exceptions, therefore, that are moved in arrest of judgment must be much more material and glaring than such as will maintain a demurrer, or, in other words, many inaccuracies and omissions, which would be fatal if early observed, are cured by a subsequent verdict, and not suffered in the last stage of a cause to unravel the whole proceedings. But if the thing omitted be essential to the action or defense, as if the plaintiff does not merely state his title in a defective manner, but sets forth a title that is totally defective in itself, or if to an action of debt the defendant pleads not guilty instead of nil debet, these cannot be cured by a verdict for the plaintiff in the first case, or for the defendant in the second. If, by the misconduct or inadvertence of the pleaders, the issue be joined on a fact totally immaterial or insufficient to determine the right, so that the court, upon finding, cannot know for whom judgment ought to be given, as if on an action on the case in a sumsit against an executor, he pleads that he himself, instead of the testator, made no such promise, or if, in an action of debt on bond, conditioned to pay money on or before a certain day, the defendant pleads payment on the day, which, if found for the plaintiff, would be inconclusive as it might have been paid before. In these cases, the court will after verdict award a repleter, quod partes red placitent, unless it appears from the whole record that nothing material can possibly be pleaded in any shape whatsoever, and then a repleter would be fruitless. And whenever a repleter is granted, the pleadings must begin de novo at that stage of them, whether it be the plea, replication, or rejoinder, etc., wherein there appears to have been the first defect or deviation from the regular course. 
If judgment is not by some of these means arrested within the first four days of the next term after the trial, it is then to be entered on the roll or record. Judgments are the sentence of the law pronounced by the court upon the matter contained in the record and are of four sorts. First, where the facts are confessed by the parties and the law determined by the court, as in the case of judgment upon demurrer. Secondly, where the law is admitted by the parties and the facts disputed, as in a case of judgment on a verdict. Thirdly, where both the fact and the law arising thereon are admitted by the defendant, which is the case of judgments by confession or default. Or lastly, where the plaintiff is convinced that either fact or law or both are insufficient to support his action, and therefore abandons or withdraws his prosecution, which is the case of judgments upon a non-suit or retracts it. The judgment, though pronounced or awarded by the judges, is not their determination or sentence, but the determination and sentence of the law. It is the conclusion that naturally and regularly follows from the premises of law and fact, which stand thus, Against him who hath rode over my corn, I may recover damages by law. But A hath rode over my corn, therefore I shall recover damages against A. If the major proposition be denied, this is a demurrer in law. If the minor, it is then an issue of fact. But if both be confessed or determined to be right, the conclusion or judgment of the court cannot but follow. Which judgment or conclusion depends not therefore on the arbitrary caprice of the judge, but on the settled and invariable principles of justice? The judgment, in short, is the remedy prescribed by law for the redress of injuries, and the suit or action is the vehicle or means of administering it. What that remedy may be is indeed the result of deliberation and study to point out, and therefore the style of the judgment is, not that it is decreed or resolved by the court, for then the judgment might appear to be their own, but it is considered consideratum est percurium, that the plaintiff do recover his damages, his debt, his possession, and the like, which implies that the judgment is none of their own, but the act of law, pronounced and declared by the court after due deliberation and inquiry. All these species of judgments are either interlocutory or final. Interlocutory judgments are such as are given in the middle of a cause upon some plea, proceeding, or default which is only intermediate and does not finally determine or complete the suit. Of this nature are all judgments for the plaintiff upon pleas and abatement of the suit or action, in which it is considered by the court that the defendant do answer over respondeot auster, that is, put in a more substantial plea. It is easy to observe that the judgment here given is not final, but merely interlocutory for there are afterwards farther proceedings to be had when the defendant hath put in a better answer. But the interlocutory judgments most usually spoken of are those incomplete judgments whereby the right of the plaintiff is indeed established, but the quantum of damages sustained by him is not ascertained, which is a matter that cannot be done without the intervention of a jury. As by the old Gothic constitution the cause was not completely finished till the nemda or jurors were called in ad executionum decretorum judici, ad estimationem priti, damni, lucri, etc. This can only happen where the plaintiff recovers, for when judgment is given for the defendant it is always complete as well as final. And this happens in the first place where the defendant suffers judgment to go against him by default, or nihil dicit, as if he puts in no plea at all to the plaintiff's declaration, by confession, or cognovit actionem, where he acknowledges the plaintiff's demand to be just, or by non sum informatus, when the defendant's attorney declares he has no instructions to say anything in answer to the plaintiff or in defense of his client, 
which is a species of judgment by default. If these or any of them happen in actions where the specific thing sued for is recovered, as in actions of debt in you or debt for a sum or thing certain, the judgment is absolutely complete. And therefore, it is very usual in order to strengthen a bond creditor's security for the debtor to execute a warrant of attorney to anyone, empowering him to confess a judgment by either of the ways just now mentioned, by nihil dicit cognovit actionem or non sum informatus in an action of debt to be brought by the creditor for the specific sum due which judgment, when confessed, is absolutely complete and binding. But where damages are to be recovered, a jury must be called in to assess them, unless the defendant to save charges will confess the whole damages laid in the declaration. Otherwise, the entry of judgment is that the plaintiff ought to recover his damages indefinitely, but because the court know not what damages the said plaintiff hath sustained, Therefore the sheriff is commanded that by the oaths of twelve honest and lawful men he inquire into the said damages and return such inquisition when taken into court. This process is called a writ of inquiry, in the execution of which the sheriff sits as judge and tries by a jury, subject to nearly the same law and conditions as the trial by jury at Nisi Prius, what damages the plaintiff hath really sustained and when their verdict is given, which must assess some damages, but to what amount they please, the sheriff returns the inquisition into court, which is entered upon the roll in manner of a postia, and thereupon it is considered that the plaintiff do recover the exact sum of the damages so assessed. In like manner, when a demurrer is determined for the plaintiff upon an action wherein damages are recovered, the judgment is also incomplete till a writ of inquiry is awarded to assess damages and returned, after which the judgment is completely entered. Final judgments are such as at once put an end to the action, by declaring that the plaintiff has either entitled himself or has not to recover the remedy he sues for. In which case, if the judgment be for the plaintiff, it is also considered that the defendant be either immersed for his willful delay of justice in not immediately obeying the king's writ by rendering the plaintiff his due, or be taken up, capiator, to pay a fine to the king in case of any forcible injury. Though now, by statute 5 and 6, William and Mary, C. 12, no writ of copyists shall issue for this fine, but the plaintiff shall pay six shillings, eight pence, and be allowed it against the defendant among his other costs. And therefore, in judgments in the court of common pleas, they enter that the fine is remitted, and in the court of king's bench they now take no notice of any fine or copyist at all. But if judgment be for the defendant, then it is considered that the plaintiff and his pledges of prosecuting be nominally immersed for his false suit, and that the defendant may go without a day, et sine die, that is, without any farther continuance or adjournment, the king's writ commanding his attendance being now fully satisfied and his innocence publicly cleared. Thus much for judgments to which costs are a necessary appendage it being now as well the maxim of ours as of the civil law, that victis victori in expensis condemnandus est. Though the common law did not professedly allow any, the immersement of the vanquished party being his only punishment. The first statute which gave costs, eo nomine, to the demandant in a real action was the statute of Gloucester, 6 Edward I, C1, as did the statute of Marlbridge, 52 Henry III, C6, to the defendant in one particular case relative to wardship and chivalry, though in reality costs were always considered and included in the quantum of damages in such actions where damages are given, and even now costs for the plaintiff are always entered on the roll as increase of damages by the court. But because those damages were frequently inadequate to the plaintiff's expenses, 
the statute of Gloucester orders costs to be also added and farther directs that the same rule shall hold place in all cases where the party is to recover damages. And therefore, in such actions where no damages were then recoverable, as in quare impedit, in which damages were not given till the statute of Westminster II, 13 Edward I, no costs are now allowed unless they have been expressly given by some subsequent statute. The statute 3, Henry the Seventh, C. 10, was the first which allowed any costs on a writ of error. But no costs were allowed the defendant in any shape till the statutes 23, Henry the Eighth, C. 15, 4, James the First, C. 3, 8 and 9, William the Third, C. 11, and 4 and 5, and C. 16, which very equitably gave the defendant, if he prevailed, the same costs as the plaintiff would have had in case he had recovered. These costs on both sides are taxed and moderated by the prothontory or other proper officer of the court. The king, and any person suing to his use, shall neither pay nor receive costs, for besides that he is not included under the general words of these statutes, as it is his prerogative not to pay them to a subject, so it is beneath his dignity to receive them. And it seems reasonable to suppose that the Queen Consort participates of the same privilege, for in actions brought by her, she was not at common law obliged to find pledges of prosecution, nor could be immersed in case there was judgment against her. In two other cases an exemption also lies from paying costs. Executors and administrators, when suing in the right of the deceased, shall pay none. And paupers, that is such as will swear themselves not worth five pounds, are, by statute 11, Henry the Seventh, C. 12, to have original writs and subpoenas gratis, and counsel and attorneys assign them without fee, and are excluded from paying costs when plaintiffs, by the statute 23, Henry the Eighth, C. 15, but shall suffer other punishment at the discretion of the judges. And it was formerly usual to give such paupers, if non-suited, their election either to be whipped or pay the costs, though that practice is now disused. It seems, however, agreed that a pauper may recover costs, though he pays none, for the council and clerks are bound to give their labor to him, but not to his antagonists. To prevent also trifling and malicious actions for words, for assault and battery, and for trespass, it is enacted by statutes 43 Elizabeth C. 6, 21 James I C. 16, and 22 and 23 Charles II C. 9 S. 136, that where the jury who try any of these actions shall give less damages than forty shillings, the plaintiff shall be allowed no more costs than damages, unless the judge before whom the cause is tried shall certify under his hand on the back of the record that an actual battery, and not an assault only, was proved, or that in trespass the freehold or title of the land came chiefly in question. Also, by statute 4 and 5, William and Mary, C. 23, and 8 and 9, William the Third C. 11, if the trespass were committed in hunting or sporting by an inferior tradesman, or if it appear to be willfully and maliciously committed, the plaintiff shall have full costs, though his damages as assessed by the jury amount to less than 40 shillings. After judgment is entered, Execution will immediately follow unless the party condemned thinks himself unjustly aggrieved by any of these proceedings, and then he has his remedy to reverse them by several writs in the nature of appeals, which we shall consider in the succeeding chapter. End of chapter 24, part 2. Chapter 25 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Roy Haynes of Proceedings in the Nature of Appeals Proceedings in the Nature of Appeals from the Proceedings of the King's Courts of Law are of various kinds according to the subject matter in which they are concerned. They are principally three. One, a writ of attaint, which lieth to inquire whether a jury of twelve men gave a false verdict, that so the judgment following thereupon may be reversed, and this must be brought in the lifetime of him for whom the verdict was given, and of two at least of the jurors who gave it. This lay at the common law only upon verdicts in actions for such personal injuries as did not amount to trespass, for in real wrongs the party injured had redressed by a writ of right, but after a verdict against him in personal suits he had no other remedy, and it did not lie in actions of trespass for a very extraordinary reason, because if the verdict was set aside the king would lose his fine. But by statute Westminster 1, 3, Edward I, C. 38, it was given in all pleas of land, franchise, or freehold, and by several subsequent statutes in the reigns of Edward III and his grandson, it was allowed in almost every action except in a writ of right. For there no attaint lay, either by common law or statute, because it was determined by the grand assize consisting of sixteen jurors. The jury who are to try this false verdict must be twenty-four, and are called the grand jury. For the law wills not that the oath of one jury of twelve men should be attainted or set aside by an equal number, nor by less indeed than double the former. And he that brings the attaint can give no other evidence to the grand jury than what was originally given to the petite. For as their verdict is now trying, and the question is whether or no they did right upon the evidence that appeared to them, the law judged it the highest absurdity to produce any subsequent proof upon such trial, and to condemn the prior jurisdiction for not believing evidence which they never knew. But those against whom it is brought are allowed, in affirmance of the first verdict, to produce new matter because the petite jury may have formed their verdict upon evidence of their own knowledge which never appeared in court, and because very terrible was the judgment which the common law inflicted upon them if the grand jury found their verdict a false one. The judgment was, one, that they should lose their liberum legem and become forever infamous, two, that they should forfeit all their goods and chattels, three, that their lands and tenements should be seized into the king's hands, four, that their wives and children should be thrown out of doors, five, that their houses should be raised and thrown down, six, that their trees should be rooted up, seven, that their meadows should be ploughed, eight, that their bodies should be cast into jail, nine, that the party should be restored to all that he lost by reason of the unjust verdict. But as the severity of this punishment had its usual effect in preventing the law from being executed, therefore by the statute 11 Henry VII c. 24, revived by 23 Henry VIII c. 3, a more moderate punishment was inflicted upon attainted jurors, viz. perpetual infamy, and, if the cause of action were above forty pounds value, a forfeiture of twenty pounds apiece by the jurors, or if under forty pounds, then five pounds apiece, so to be divided between the king and the party injured. So that a man may now bring in a taint either upon the statute or at common law at his election, and in both of them may reverse the former judgment. But the practice of setting aside verdicts upon motion and granting new trials has so superseded the use of both sorts of attaints that I have not observed any instance of an attaint in our books later than the 16th century. By the old Gothic constitution, indeed, no certificate of a judge was allowed in matters of evidence to countervail the oath of the jury, but their verdict, however erroneous, was absolutely final and conclusive. Testi sunt de judus et de actis eius. Judex vero de ipsis visissum testari non potest, vere un falso jurent, 
qualcunque enem eorum assertionis nandum est et judicandum. Yet they had a proceeding from whence our taint may be derived. If upon a lawful trial before a superior tribunal they were found to have given a false verdict, they were fined and rendered infamous for the future. Si tamen evidente argumente falsum jurase convincantor, id quod superius judicium cognoscieri debet, multantor in bonus, de caetero perjuri et intestabiles. 2. An audita querella is where the defendant against whom judgment is recovered and who is therefore in danger of execution, or perhaps actually in execution, may be relieved upon good matter of discharge which has happened since the judgment, as if the plaintiff hath given him a general release, or if the defendant hath paid the debt to the plaintiff without entering satisfaction on the record. In these and the like cases wherein the defendant hath good matter to plead, but hath had no opportunity of pleading it, either at the beginning of suit, or puis darein continuance, which, as was shown in a former chapter, must always be before judgment, an audita querela lies in the nature of a bill in equity to be relieved against the oppression of the plaintiff. It is a writ directed to the court, stating that the complaint of the defendant hath been heard audita querela defendentis, and then setting out the matter of the complaint, it at length enjoins the court to call the parties before them, and having heard their allegations and proofs, to cause justice to be done between them. It also lies for bail when judgment is obtained against them by sciere facius to answer the debt of their principal, and it happens afterwards that the original judgment against their principal is reversed. For here the bail, after judgment had against them, had no opportunity to plead the special matter, and therefore they shall have redress by audita querela, which is a writ of a most remedial nature, and seems to have been invented, lest in any case there should be an oppressive defect of justice, where a party has a good defense, but by the ordinary forms of law had no opportunity to make it. But the indulgence now shown by the courts in granting a summary relief upon motion in cases of such evident oppression has almost rendered useless the writ of Audita Querela and driven it quite out of practice. 3. But thirdly, the principal method of redress for erroneous judgments in the King's Court of Record is by writ of error to some superior court of appeal. A writ of error lies for some supposed mistake in the proceedings of a court of record. For to amend errors in a base court, not of record, a writ of false judgment lies. The writ of error only lies upon matter of law arising upon the face of the proceedings so that no evidence is required to substantiate or support it, and there is no method of reversing an error in the determination of facts but by an attaint or a new trial to correct the mistakes of the former verdict. Formerly, the suitors were much perplexed by writs of error brought upon very slight and trivial grounds, as misspellings and other mistakes of the clerks, all which might be amended at the common law while all the proceedings were in paper for they were then considered only in fieri, and therefore subject to the control of the courts. But when once the record was made up, it was formally held that by the common law, no amendment could be permitted unless within the very term in which the judicial act so recorded was done. For during the term the record is in the breast of the court, but afterwards it admitted no alteration. But now the courts are become more liberal, and where justice requires it, will allow of amendments at any time while the suit is depending, notwithstanding the record be made up and the term be passed. For they at present consider the proceedings as infieri till judgment is given, and therefore that till then they have the power to permit amendments by the common law. Mistakes are also effectually helped by the statutes of amendment and geophiles so called because when a pleader perceives any slip in the form of his proceedings and acknowledges such error geophile he is at liberty by those statutes to amend it 
which amendment is seldom actually made, but the benefit of the acts is attained by the courts overlooking the exception. These statutes are many in number, and the provisions in them too minute and particular to be here taken notice of, otherwise than by referring to the statutes themselves, by which all trifling exceptions are so thoroughly guarded against, that writs of error cannot now be maintained, but for some material mistake assigned. This is at present the general doctrine of amendments, and its rise in history are somewhat curious. In the early ages of our jurisprudence, when all pleadings were ore tenus, if a slip was perceived and objected to by the opposite party or the court, the pleader instantly acknowledged his error and rectified his plea, which gave occasion to that length of dialogue reported in the ancient yearbooks. So liberal were then the sentiments of the crown as well as the judges, that in the statute of Wales made at Rothland, 12 Edward I, the pleadings are directed to be carried on in that principality, sine calumnia verborum, non observata illa dura consuetudine, qui cadit a salaba cadit a tota causa. The judgments were entered up immediately by the clerks and the officers of the court, and if any misentry was made, it was rectified by the minutes or the remembrance of the court itself. When the treatise by Britain was published in the name and by authority of the king, probably about 13 Edward I, because the last statutes therein referred to are those of Winchester and Westminster II, a check seems intended to be given to the unwarrantable practices of some judges who had made false entries on the rolls to cover their own misbehavior and had taken upon them by amendments and razures to falsify their own records. The king therefore declares that, although we have granted to our justices to make record of pleas pleaded before them, yet we will not that their own record shall be a warranty for their own wrong, nor that they may raise their rolls, nor amend them, nor record them, contrary to their original enrollment. The whole of which, taken together, amounts to this, that a record surreptitiously or erroneously made up to stifle or pervert the truth should not be a sanction for error and that a record originally made up according to the truth of the case should not afterwards by any private razure or amendment be altered to any sinister purpose. But when afterwards King Edward, on his return from his French dominions in the seventeenth year of his reign, after upwards of three years' absence, found it necessary or convenient to prosecute his judges for their corruption and other malpractices, the perversion of judgments by erasing and altering records was one of the causes assigned for the heavy punishments inflicted upon almost all the king's justices, even the most able and upright. The severity of which proceedings seems so to have alarmed the succeeding judges that through a fear of being said to do wrong, they hesitated at doing that which was right. As it was so hazardous to alter a record, even from compassionate motives, as happened in Hingham's case, which in strictness was certainly indefensible, they resolved not to touch a record any more, but held that even palpable errors, when enrolled and the term at end, were too sacred to be rectified or called in question. And because Britain had forbidden all criminal and clandestine alterations to make a record speak a falsity, they conceived that they might not judicially and publicly amend it to make it agreeable to the truth. In Edward III's time, indeed, they once ventured, upon the certificate of the justice in ire, to a street a larger fine than had been recorded by the clerk of the court below. But instead of amending the clerk's erroneous record, they made a second enrollment of what the justice had declared ore tenus and left it to be settled by posterity in which of the two roles that absolute verity resides, which every record is said to import in itself. And, in the reign of Richard II, there are instances of their refusing to amend the most palpable errors and misentries unless by the authority of Parliament. To this real sullenness but affected timidity of the judges, such a narrowness of thinking was added that every slip, 
even of a syllable or a letter, was now held to be fatal to the pleader and overturned his client's cause. If they durst not or would not set right mere formal mistakes at any time upon equitable terms and conditions, they at least should have held that trifling objections were at all times inadmissible, and that more solid exceptions in point of form came too late when the merits had been tried. They might, through a decent degree of tenderness, have excused themselves from amending in criminal and especially in capital cases. They needed not have granted an amendment where it would work an injustice to either party or where he could not be put in as good a condition as if his adversary had made no mistake. And if it was feared that an amendment after trial might subject the jury to an attaint, how easy it was to make waiving the attaint the condition of allowing the amendment. And yet these were among the absurd reasons alleged for never suffering amendments at all. The precedents then set were afterwards most scrupulously followed to the great obstruction of justice and ruin of the suitors, who have formerly suffered as much by these obstinate scruples and literal strictness of the courts as they could have done by their iniquity. After verdicts and judgments upon the merits, they were frequently reversed for slips of the pen or misspellings, and justice was perpetually entangled in a net of mere technical jargon. The legislature hath therefore been forced to interpose by no less than twelve statutes to remedy these opprobrious niceties, and its endeavors have been of late so well seconded by judges of a more liberal caste that this unseemly degree of strictness is almost entirely eradicated, and will probably in a few years be no more remembered than the learnings of assoins and defaults, or the counterpleas of voucher, are at present. But, to return to our writs of error. If a writ of error be brought after verdict, he that brings the writ, or that is, the plaintiff in error, must in most cases find substantial pledges of prosecution or bail to prevent delays by frivolous pretenses to appeal and for securing payments of costs and damages which are now payable by the vanquished party in all except a few particular instances by virtue of the several statutes recited in the margin. A writ of error lies from the inferior courts of record in England into the king's bench, and not into the common pleas. Also, from the king's bench in Ireland to the king's bench in England. It likewise may be brought from the common pleas at Westminster to the king's bench, and then from the king's bench the cause is removable to the House of Lords. From the proceedings on the law side of the exchequer, a writ of error lies into the Court of Exchequer Chamber before the Lord Chancellor, Lord Treasurer, and the judges of the Court of King's Bench and Common Pleas, and from thence it lies to the House of Peers. From proceedings in the King's Bench, in debt, detinue, covenant, account, case, ejectment, or trespass, originally begun therein, except where the King is party, it lies to the Exchequer Chamber, before the justices of the common pleas and the barons of the exchequer, and from thence also to the House of Lords. But where the proceedings in the king's bench are commenced by original writ, sued out of chancery, which must be for some forcible injury in which the king is supposed to be a party in order to punish the trespass committed in a criminal manner, this takes the case out of the general rule laid down by the statute, so that the writ of error then lies, without any intermediate stage of appeal, directly to the House of Lords, the dernier resort for the ultimate decision of every civil action. Each court of appeal, in their respective stages, may upon hearing the matter of law in which the error is assigned, reverse or affirm the judgment of the inferior courts but none of them are final, save only the House of Peers, to whose judicial decisions all other tribunals must therefore submit and conform their own. And thus much for reversal or affirmance of judgments by writs in the nature of appeals. End of chapter 25《Of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes of Execution, Part 1. If the regular judgment of the court after the decision of the suit be not suspended, superseded, or reversed by one or other of the methods mentioned in the two preceding chapters, the next and last step is the execution of that judgment or putting the sentence of the law in force. This is performed in different manners according to the nature of the action upon which it is founded and of the judgment which is had or recovered. If the plaintiff recovers in an action real or mixed, wherein the season or possession of land is awarded to him, the writ of execution shall be an abere facia sezinum, or writ of season of freehold, or an abere facius possessionum, or writ of possession of a chattel interest. These are writs directed to the sheriff of the county, commanding him to give actual possession to the plaintiff of the land so recovered, in the execution of which the sheriff may take with him the posse comitatus, or power of the county, and may justify breaking open doors if the possession be not quietly delivered. But if it be peaceably yielded up, the delivery of a twig, a turf, or a ring of the door, in the name of season, is sufficient execution of the writ. Upon a presentation to a benefice recovered in a quare impedit, or a seize of darain presentment, the execution is by writ de clerico admitendo, directed not to the sheriff, but to the bishop or his metropolitan, requiring them to admit and institute the clerk of the plaintiff. In other actions where the judgment is that something in special be done or rendered by the defendant, then, in order to compel him to do so, and to see the judgment executed, a special writ of execution issues to the sheriff according to the nature of the case. As upon an assize or quod permitat prostenere for a nuisance, where one part of the judgment is quod amoviator, a writ goes to the sheriff to abate it at the charge of the party, which likewise issues even in case of an indictment. Upon a replevin, the writ of execution is that de retorno abendo, and if the distress be aloined, the defendant shall have a copius in withernum, but on the plaintiff tendering the damages and submitting to a fine, the process in withernum shall be stayed. In detinue, after judgment, the plaintiff shall have a distringus to compel the defendant to deliver the goods by repeated distresses of his chattels, or else a sciere facius against a third person in whose hands they may happen to be to show cause why they should not be delivered, and if the defendant still continues obstinate, the sheriff shall summon an inquest to ascertain the plaintiff's damages, which shall be levied, like other damages, by seizure of the person or goods of the defendant. So that, after all, in replevin and detinue, the only actions for recovering specific possession of personal chattels, if the wrongdoer be very perverse, he cannot be compelled to a restitution of the identical thing taken or detained, but he still has his election to deliver the goods or their value, an imperfection in the law that results from the nature of personal property, which is easily concealed or conveyed out of the reach of justice, and not, like land or another real property, always amenable to the magistrate. Executions in actions where money only is recovered, as a debt or damages, and not any specific chattel, are of five sorts, either against the body of the defendant, or against his goods and chattels, or against his goods and the profits of his lands, or against his goods and the possession of his lands, or against all three, his body, lands, and goods. 1. The first species of execution is by writ of copius ad satisfaciendum, which distinguishes it from the former copius ad respondendum, which lies to compel an appearance at the beginning of a suit. And, properly speaking, this cannot be sued out against any but such as were liable to be taken upon the former copyists. 
The intent of it is to imprison the body of the debtor till satisfaction be made for the debt, costs, and damages. It therefore doth not lie against any privileged persons, peers, or members of Parliament, nor against executors or administrators, nor against such other persons as could not be originally held to bail. And Sir Edward Coke also gives us a singular instance where a defendant in 14 Edward III was discharged from a copyist because he was of so advanced an age, quod poenum in prisonamenti subire non potest. If an action be brought against an husband and wife for the debt of the wife when sole, and the plaintiff recovers judgment, the copyist shall issue to take both the husband and wife in execution. But if the action was originally brought against herself when sole, and pending the suit she marries, the copyist shall be awarded against her only and not against her husband. Yet if judgment be recovered against an husband and wife for the contract, nay, even for the personal misbehavior of the wife during her coverture, the copyist shall issue against the husband only, which is one of the greatest privileges of English wives. The writ of copyist ad satisfaciendum is an execution of the highest nature, inasmuch as it deprives a man of his liberty till he makes the satisfaction awarded. And therefore, when a man is once taken in execution upon this writ, no other process can be sued out against his lands or goods. Only, by statute 21 James I c. 24, if the defendant dies while charged in execution upon this writ, the plaintiff may, after his death, sue out new executions against his lands, goods, or chattels. The writ is directed to the sheriff, commanding him to take the body of the defendant and have him at Westminster on a day therein named to make the plaintiff satisfaction for his demand. And if he does not then make satisfaction, he must remain in custody till he does. This writ may be sued out, as may all other executory process, for costs against the plaintiff as well as the defendant when judgment is had against him. When a defendant is once in custody upon this process, he is to be kept in arcta et salva custodia, and if he be afterwards seen at large, it is an escape, and the plaintiff may have an action thereupon against the sheriff for his whole debt. For though upon arrests and what is called mean process, being such as intervenes between the commencement and end of a suit, the sheriff till the statute 8 and 9, William III, C. 27, might have indulged the defendant as he pleased, so as he produced him in court to answer the plaintiff at return of the writ. Yet, upon the taking an execution, he could never give any indulgence, for in that case confinement is the whole of the debtor's punishment and of the satisfaction made to the creditor. Escapes are either voluntary or negligent. Voluntary are such as are by the express consent of the keeper, after which he can never retake his prisoner again, though the plaintiff may retake him at any time, but the sheriff must answer for the debt. Negligent escapes are where the prisoner escapes without his keeper's knowledge or consent, and then, upon fresh pursuit, the defendant may be retaken, and the sheriff shall be excused if he has him again before any action brought against him for the escape. A rescue of a prisoner in execution, either going to jail or in jail, or a breach of prison, will not excuse the sheriff from being guilty of and answering for the escape, for he ought to have sufficient force to keep him, seeing he may command the power of the county. But by statute 32 George II C28, if a defendant charged in execution for any debt less than a hundred pounds will surrender all his effects to his creditors except his apparel, bedding, and tools of his trade not amounting in the whole to the value of ten pounds and will make oath of his punctual compliance with the statute, the prisoner may be discharged unless the creditor insists on detaining him in which case he shall allow him two shillings four pence per week to be paid on the first day of every week, and on failure of regular payment, 
the prisoner shall be discharged. Yet the creditor may at any future time have execution against the lands and goods of the defendant, though never more against his person. And on the other hand, the creditors may, as in the case of bankruptcy, compel, under pain of transportation for seven years, such debtor charged in execution for any debt under a hundred pounds to make a discovery and surrender all of his effects for their benefit whereupon he is also entitled to the like discharge of his person. If a copious ad satisfaciendum is sued out and a non est inventus is returned thereon, the plaintiff may sue out a process against the bail if any were given, who we may remember stipulated in this triple alternative, that the defendant should, if condemned in the suit, satisfy the plaintiff his debt and costs, or that he should surrender himself a prisoner, or that they would pay it for him. As therefore the two former branches of the alternative are neither of them complied with, the latter must immediately take place. In order to which a writ of shire facius may be sued out against the bail, commanding them to show cause why the plaintiff should not have execution against them for his debt and damages, and on such writ, if they show no sufficient cause, or the defendant does not surrender himself on the day of the return, or of showing cause, for afterwards is not sufficient, the plaintiff may have judgment against the bail, and take out a writ of copious ad satisfaciendum, or other process of execution against them. 2. The next species of execution is against the goods and chattels of the defendant, and is called a writ of fieri facius, from the words in it where the sheriff is commanded, quod fieri faciat de bonus, that he caused to be made of the goods and chattels of the defendant the sum or debt recovered. This lies as well against privileged persons, peers, etc., as other common persons, and against executors or administrators with regard to the goods of the deceased. The sheriff may not break open any outer doors to execute this or the former writ, but must enter peaceably, and may then break open any inner door belonging to the defendant in order to take the goods. And he may sell the goods and chattels, even in a state for years which is a chattel reel, of the defendant, till he has raised enough to satisfy the judgment and costs, first paying the landlord of the premises upon which the goods are found, the arrears of rent then due, not exceeding one year's rent in the whole. If part only of the debt be levied on a fieri facius, the plaintiff may have a copious ad satisfaciendum for the residue. 3. A third species of execution is by writ of levare facius, which affects a man's goods and the profits of his lands by commanding the sheriff to levy the plaintiff's debt upon the lands and goods of the defendant, whereby the sheriff may seize all his goods and receive the rents and profits of his lands till satisfaction be made to the plaintiff. Little use is now made of this writ. The remedy by elegit which takes possession of the lands themselves, being much more effectual. But of this species is a writ of execution proper only to ecclesiastics, which is given when the sheriff, upon a common writ of execution sued, returns that the defendant is a beneficed clerk, not having any lay fee. In this case, a writ goes to the bishop of the diocese, in the nature of a levari or fieri facius, to levy the debt and damages de bonus ecclesiasticis, which are not to be touched by lay hands, and thereupon the bishop sends out a sequestration of the profits of the clerk's benefice directed to the church wardens to collect the same and pay them to the plaintiff till the sum be raised. End of chapter 26, part 1. Chapter 26, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Execution, Part 2. Or, the fourth species of execution is by the writ of elegy, which is a judicial writ given by the statute Westminster 2, 13, Edward I, C. 18, either upon a judgment for a debt or damages or upon a forfeiture of a recognizance taken in the king's court. By the common law, a man could only have satisfaction of goods, chattels, and the present profits of lands by the two last mentioned writs of Fieri Facius and Livari Facius, but not the possession of the lands themselves, which was a natural consequence of the feudal principles which prohibited the alienation and, of course, the encumbering of the fief with the debts of the owner. And when the restriction of alienation began to wear away, the consequence still continued, and no creditor could take the possession of lands but only levy the growing profits, so that if the defendant aliened his lands, the plaintiff was ousted of his remedy. The statute therefore granted this writ, called an elegit because it is in the choice or election of the plaintiff whether he will sue out this writ or one of the former, by which the defendant's goods and chattels are not sold but only appraised, and all of them, except oxen and beasts of the plough, are delivered to the plaintiff at such reasonable appraisement and price in part of satisfaction of his debt. If the goods are not sufficient, then the moiety or one half of his freehold lands, whether held in his own name or by any other in trust for him, are also to be delivered to the plaintiff, to hold till out of the rents and profits thereof the debt be levied, or till the defendant's interest be expired, as till the death of the defendant if he be tenant for life or entail. During this period the plaintiff is called tenant by elegit, of whom we spoke in a former part of these commentaries. We there observe that till this statute, by the common law, lands were not liable to be charged with or seized for debts because by this means the connection between the lord and tenant might be destroyed, fraudulent alienations might be made, and the services be transferred to be performed by a stranger, provided the tenant incurred a large debt sufficient to cover the land. And therefore, even by this statute, only one half was, and now is, subject to execution that out of the remainder sufficient might be left for the Lord to distrain upon for his services. And upon the same feudal principle, copyhold lands are at this day not liable to be taken in execution upon a judgment. But in case of a debt to the king, it appears by Magna Carta C. 8 that it was allowed by the common law for him to take possession of the lands till the debt was paid. For he, being the grand superior and ultimate proprietor of all landed estates, might seize the lands into his own hands if anything was owing from the vassal, and could not be said to be defrauded of his services when the ouster of the vassal proceeded from his own command. This execution, or seizing of lands by elegit, is of so high a nature that after it the body of the defendant cannot be taken. But if execution can only be had of the goods, because there are no lands, and such goods are not sufficient to pay the debt, a copious ad satisfaciendum may then be had after the elegit, for such elegit is in this case no more in effect than a fieri facius, so that body and goods may be taken in execution, or land and goods, but not body and land too upon any judgment between subject and subject in the course of the common law, but five upon some prosecutions given by statute, as in the case of recognizances or debts acknowledged on statutes merchant or statutes staple, pursuant to the statutes 13 Edward I de Mercaribus and 27 Edward III C9, upon forfeiture of these, the body, lands, and goods may all be taken at once in execution to compel the payment of the debt. The process hereon is usually called an extent, or extendi facius, because the sheriff is to cause the lands, etc., 
to be appraised to their full extended value before he delivers them to the plaintiff, that it may be certainly known how soon the debt will be satisfied. And by statute 33 Henry VIII C. 39, all obligations made to the king shall have the same force, and of consequence the same remedy to recover them as a statute staple. Though indeed, before this statute, the king was entitled to sue out execution against the body, lands, and goods of his accountant or debtor. And his debt shall, in suing out execution, be preferred to that of every other creditor who hath not obtained judgment before the king commenced his suit. The king's judgment also affects all lands which the king's debtor hath at or after the time of contracting his debt, or which any of his officers mentioned in the statute 13 Elizabeth C. 4 hath at or after the time of his entering on the office, so that if such officer of the crown aliens for a valuable consideration, the land shall be liable to the king's debt even in the hands of a bona fide purchaser, though the money for which he is accountable was received by the vendor many years after the alienation. Whereas judgments between subject and subject related, even at common law, no farther back than the first day of the term in which they were recovered in respect of the lands of the debtor, and did not bind his goods and chattels, but from the date of the writ of execution. And now, by the statute of frauds, 29 Charles II, C3, the judgment shall not bind the land in the hands of a bona fide purchaser, but only from the time of actually signing the same, nor the goods in the hands of a stranger or a purchaser, but only from the actual delivery of the writ to the sheriff. These are the methods by which the law of England has pointed out for the execution of judgments, and when the plaintiff's demand is satisfied, either by the voluntary payment of the defendant or by this compulsory process or otherwise, satisfaction ought to be entered on the record that the defendant may not be liable to be hereafter harassed a second time on the same account. But all these writs of execution must be sued out within a year and a day after the judgment is entered. Otherwise, the court concludes prima facie that the judgment is satisfied and extinct. Yet, however, it will grant a writ of Shire Facius in pursuance of statute Westminster 2, 13 Edward I, C. 45, for the defendant to show cause why the judgment should not be revived and execution had against him, to which the defendant may plead such matter as he has to allege in order to show why process of execution should not be issued, or the plaintiff may still bring an action of debt founded on this dormant judgment which was the only method of revival allowed by the common law. In this manner are the several remedies given by the English law for all sorts of injuries, either real or personal, administered by the several courts of justice and their respective officers. In the course, therefore, of the present volume, we have first seen and considered the nature of remedies by the mere act of the parties or mere operation of law, without any suit in courts. We have next taken a view of remedies by suit or action in courts, and therein have contemplated first the nature and species of courts instituted for the redress of injuries in general, and then have shown in what particular courts application must be made for the redress of particular injuries or the doctrine of jurisdictions and cognizance. We afterwards proceeded to consider the nature and distribution of wrongs and injuries affecting every species of personal and real rights with the respective remedies by suit which the law of the land has afforded for every possible injury. And lastly, we have deduced and pointed out the method and progress of obtaining such remedies in the courts of justice, proceeding from the first general complaint or original writ through all the stages of process to compel the defendant's appearance and of pleading or formal allegation on the one side and excuse or denial on the other, with the examination of the validity of such complaint or excuse upon demurrer or the truth of the facts alleged and denied upon issue joined and its several trials, 
to the judgment or sentence of the law with respect to the nature and amount of the redress to be specifically given, Hill, after considering the suspension of that judgment by writs in the nature of appeals, we arrived at its final execution, which puts the party in specific possession of his right by the intervention of ministerial officers, or else gives him an ample satisfaction, either by equivalent damages, or by the confinement of his body, who is guilty of the injury complained of. This care and circumspection in the law in providing that no man's right shall be affected by any legal proceeding without giving him previous notice, and yet that the debtor shall not by receiving such notice take occasion to escape from justice, in requiring that every complaint be accurately and precisely ascertained in writing and be as pointedly and exactly answered, in clearly stating the question of either law or of fact, in deliberately resolving the former after full argumentative discussion, and indisputably fixing the latter by a diligent and impartial trial, in correcting such errors as may have arisen in either of those modes of decision from accident, mistake, or surprise, and in finally enforcing the judgment when nothing can be alleged to impeach it. This anxiety to maintain and restore to every individual the enjoyment of his civil rights without entrenching upon those of any other individual in the nation, this parental solicitude which pervades our whole legal constitution, is the genuine offspring of that spirit of equal liberty which is the singular felicity of Englishmen. At the same time, it must be owned to have given an handle, in some degree, to those complaints of delay in the practice of law, which are not wholly without foundation, but are greatly exaggerated beyond the truth. There may be, it is true, in this, as in all other departments of knowledge, a few unworthy professors, who study the science of chicane and sophistry rather than of truth and justice, and who, to gratify the spleen, the dishonesty, and the willfulness of their clients, may endeavor to screen the guilty by an unwarrantable use of those means which were intended to protect the innocent. But the frequent disappointments and the constant discountenance that they meet with in the courts of justice have confined these men, to the honor of this age be it spoken, both in number and reputation, to indeed a very despicable compass. Yet some delays there certainly are and must unavoidably be in the conduct of a suit, however desirous the parties and their agents may be to come to a speedy determination. These arise from the same original causes as were mentioned in examining a former complaint, from liberty, property, civility, commerce, and an extent of populous territory, which whenever we are willing to exchange for tyranny, poverty, barbarism, idleness, and a barren desert, we may then enjoy the same dispatch of causes that is so highly extolled in some foreign countries. But common sense and a little experience will convince us that more time and circumspection are requisite in causes where the suitors have valuable and permanent rights to lose than where their property is trivial and precarious and what the law gives them today may be seized by their prince tomorrow. In Turkey, says Montesquieu, where little regard is shown to the lives or fortunes of the subject, all causes are quickly decided. The Basha, on a summary hearing, orders which party he pleases to be bastinadoed and then sends them about their business. But in free states, the trouble, expense, and delays of judicial proceedings are the price that every subject pays for his liberty. And in all governments, he adds, the formalities of law increase in proportion to the value which is set on the honor, the fortune, the liberty, and the life of the subject. From these principles, it might reasonably follow that the English courts should be more subject to delays than those of other nations, as they set a greater value on life, on liberty, and on property. But it is our peculiar felicity to enjoy the advantage and yet be exempted from a proportional share of the burthen. For the course of the civil law to which most other nations conform their practice is much more tedious than ours, 
for proof of which I need only appeal to the suitors of those courts in England where the practice of the Roman law is allowed in its full extent. And particularly in France, not only are Fortescue accusers, of his own knowledge, their courts of the most unexampled delays in administering justice, but even a writer of their own has not scrupled to testify that there were in his time more causes there depending than in all Europe besides, and some of them an hundred years old. But, not to enlarge upon the prodigious improvements which have been made in the celerity of justice by the disuse of real actions, by the statutes of amendments and geophiles, and by other more modern regulations which it now might be indelicate to mention, but which posterity will never forget, the time and attendance afforded by the judges in our English courts are also greater than those of many other countries. In the Roman calendar there were in the whole year but twenty-eight judicial or traverbial days allowed to the praetor for hearing causes whereas with us one-fourth of the year is term time in which three courts constantly sit for the dispatch of matters of law besides the very close attendance of the court of chancery for determining suits in equity and the numerous courts of assize and nisi prius that sit in vacation for the trial of matters of fact Indeed, there is no other country in the known world that hath an institution so commodious and so adapted to the dispatch of causes as our trials by jury in those courts for the decision of facts. In no other nation under heaven does justice make her progress twice in each year into every part of the kingdom to decide upon the spot by the voice of the people themselves the disputes of the remotest provinces. And here this part of our commentaries, which regularly treats only of redress at the common law, would naturally draw to a conclusion. But as the proceedings in courts of equity are very different from those at common law, and as those courts are of a very general and extensive jurisdiction, it is in some measure a branch of the talk I have undertaken to give the student some general idea of the forms of practice adopted by those courts. These will therefore be the subject of the ensuing chapter. End of chapter 26, part 2. Chapter 27, part 1 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Proceedings in the Courts of Equity, Part 1. Before we enter on the proposed subject of the ensuing chapter, viz., the nature and method of proceedings in the Courts of Equity, it will be proper to recollect the observations which were made in the beginning of this book on the principal tribunals of that kind acknowledged by the Constitution of England, and to premise a few remarks upon those particular causes wherein any of them claims and exercises a sole jurisdiction distinct from and exclusive of the other. I have already attempted to trace though very concisely, the history, rise, and progress of the extraordinary court or court of equity in chancery. The same jurisdiction is exercised and the same system of redress pursued in the equity court of the exchequer, with a distinction, however, as to some few matters peculiar to each tribunal and in which the other cannot interfere, and first of those peculiar to the chancery. 1. Upon the abolition of the Court of Wards, the care which the Crown was bound to take as guardian of its infant tenants was totally extinguished in every feudal view, but resulted to the King in his Court of Chancery, together with the general protection of all other infants in the Kingdom. When, therefore, a fatherless child has no other guardian, the Court of Chancery hath a right to appoint one, and from all proceedings relative thereto, an appeal lies to the House of Lords. The Court of Exchequer can only appoint a guardian ad litem to manage the defense of the infant if a suit be commenced against him. 
a power which is incident to the jurisdiction of every court of justice. But when the interest of a minor comes before the court judicially, in the progress of a cause or upon a bill for that purpose filed, either tribunal indiscriminately will take care of the property of the infant. 2. As to idiots and lunatics, the king himself used formally to commit the custody of them to proper committees in every particular case, but now, to avoid solicitations and the very shadow of undue partiality, a warrant is issued by the king under his royal sign manual to the chancellor or keeper of his seal to perform this office for him, and if he acts improperly in granting such custodies, the complaint must be made to the king himself in council. But the previous proceedings on the commission to inquire whether or no the party be an idiot or a lunatic are on the law side of the court of chancery and can only be redressed if erroneous by a writ of error in the regular course of the law three the king as parens patrie has the general superintendence of all charities which he exercises by the keeper of his conscience the chancellor and therefore Whenever it is necessary, the Attorney General, at the relation of some informant, who is usually called the Relator, files ex officio an information in the Court of Chancery to have the charity properly established. By statute also, 43 Elizabeth C. 4, authority is given to the Lord Chancellor or Lord Keeper and to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, respectively, to grant commissions under their several seals to inquire into any abuses of charitable donations and to rectify the same by decree, which may be reviewed in the respective courts of the several chancellors upon exceptions taken thereto. But though this is done in the petty bag office in the Court of Chancery, because the commission is there returned, it is not a proceeding at common law, but treated as an original cause in the Court of Equity. The evidence below is not taken down in writing, and the respondent, in his answer to the exceptions, may allege what new matter he pleases, upon which they go to proof and examine witnesses in writing upon all the matters in issue and the court may decree the respondent to pay all the costs, though no such authority is given by the statute. And as it is thus considered as an original cause throughout, an appeal lies of course from the Chancellor's decree to the House of Peers, notwithstanding any loose opinions to the contrary. 4. By the several statutes relating to bankrupts, a summary jurisdiction is given to the Chancellor in many matters consequential or previous to the Commission thereby directed to be issued, from which the statutes give no appeal. On the other hand, the jurisdiction of the Court of Chancery doth not extend to some causes wherein relief may be had in the Exchequer. No information can be brought in chancery for such mistaken charities as are given to the king by the statutes for suppressing superstitious uses. Nor can chancery give any relief against the king, or direct any act to be done by him, or make any decree disposing of or affecting his property, not even in cases where he is a royal trustee. Such causes must be determined in the Court of Exchequer as a court of revenue, which alone has power over the king's treasure and the officers employed in its management, unless where it properly belongs to the Duchy Court of Lancaster, which hath also a similar jurisdiction as a court of revenue, and, like the other, consists of both a court of law and a court of equity. In all other matters, what is said of the court of equity in chancery will be equally applicable to the other courts of equity. Whatever the difference there may be in the forms of practice, it arises from the different constitution of their officers, or, if they differ in anything more essential, one of them must certainly be wrong, for truth and justice are always uniform and ought equally to be adopted by them all. Let us next take a brief but comprehensive view of the general nature of equity as now understood and practiced in our several courts of judicature. I have formerly touched upon it, but imperfectly. It deserves a more complete explication. Yet, 
as nothing is hitherto extant that can give a stranger a tolerable idea of the courts of equity subsisting in England as distinguished from the courts of law, the compiler of these observations cannot but attempt it with diffidence. They who know them best are too much employed to find time to write, and they who have attended but little in those courts must often be at a loss for materials. Equity, then, in its true and genuine meaning, is the soul and spirit of all law. Positive law is construed, and rational law is made by it. In this, equity is synonymous to justice, in that, to the true sense and sound interpretation of the rule. But the very terms of a court of equity and a court of law, as contrasted to each other, are apt to confound and mislead us as if the one judged without equity and the other was not bound by any law. Whereas every definition or illustration to be met with, which now draws a line between the two jurisdictions by setting law and equity in opposition to each other, will be found either totally erroneous or erroneous to a certain degree. 1. Thus, in the first place, it is said that it is the business of the court of equity in England to abate the rigor of the common law, but no such power is contended for. Hard was the case of bond creditors whose debtor devised away his real estate, rigorous and unjust the rule which put the devisee in a better condition than the heir, yet a court of equity had no power to interpose. Hard is the common law still subsisting that land devised or descending to the heir shall not be liable to simple contract debts of the ancestor or deviser, although the money was laid out in purchasing the very land, and that the father shall never immediately succeed as heir to the real estate of the son. But a court of equity can give no relief, though in both these instances the artificial reason of the law arising from feudal principles has long ago entirely ceased. The like may be observed of the descent of lands to a remote relation of the whole blood, or even their eschet to the Lord, in preference to the owner's half-brother, and of the total stop to all justice by causing the parole to demur whenever an infant is sued as heir or is party to a real action. In all such cases of positive law, the courts of equity as well as the courts of law must say with opium, haquidum perquam durum est, sed ita lex scripta est. 2. It is said that a court of equity determines according to the spirit of the rule and not according to the strictness of the letter but so also does a court of law. Both, for instance, are equally bound and equally profess to interpret statutes according to the true intent of the legislature. In general laws, all cases cannot be foreseen, or, if foreseen, cannot be expressed. Some will arise that will fall within the meaning, though not within the words of the legislator, and others, which may fall within the letter, may be contrary to his meaning, though not expressly accepted. These cases, thus out of the letter, are often said to be within the equity of an act of Parliament, and so cases within the letter are frequently out of the equity. Here by equity we mean nothing but the sound interpretation of the law, though the words of the law itself may be too general, too special, or otherwise inaccurate or defective. These, then, are the cases which, as Grotius says, lex non exacti definit, sed arbitrio boni viri permitit, in order to find out the true sense and meaning of the lawgiver from every other topic of construction. But there is not a single rule of interpreting laws, whether equitable or strictly, that is not equally used by the judges in courts both of law and equity, the construction must in both be the same, or, if they differ, it is only as one court of law may also happen to differ from another. Each endeavors to fix and adopt the true sense of the law in question. Neither can enlarge, diminish, or alter that sense in a single tittle. 3. Again it hath been said that fraud, accident, and trust are the proper and peculiar objects of a court of equity but every kind of fraud is equally cognizable 
and equally adverted to in a court of law, and some frauds are only cognizable there as fraud in obtaining a devise of lands which is always sent out of the equity courts to be there determined. Many accidents are also supplied in a court of law, as loss of deeds, mistakes in receipts or accounts, wrong payments, deaths which make it impossible to perform a condition literally, and a multitude of other contingencies, and many cannot be relieved even in a court of equity, as if by accident the recovery is ill-suffered, a devise ill-executed, a contingent remainder destroyed, or a power of leasing omitted in a family settlement. A technical trust indeed, created by the limitation of a second use, was forced into a court of equity in the manner formerly mentioned, and this species of trusts extended by inference and construction have ever since remained as a kind of peculium in those courts. But there are other trusts which are cognizable in a court of law, as deposits and all manner of bailments, and especially that implied contract so highly beneficial and useful of having undertaken to account for money received to another's use, which is the ground of an action on the case almost as universally remedial as a bill in equity. 4. Once more, it has been said that a court of equity is not bound by rules or precedents, but acts from the opinion of the judge bounded on the circumstances of every particular case. Whereas the system of our courts of equity is a labored connected system governed by established rules and bound down by precedents from which they do not depart, although the reason of some of them may perhaps be liable to objection. Thus, the refusing a wife her dower in a trust estate, yet allowing the husband his courtesy, the holding the penalty of a bond to be merely a security for the debt and interest yet considering it sometimes as the debt itself, so that the interest shall not exceed that penalty, the distinguishing between a mortgage at 5% with a clause of reduction to 4 if the interest be regularly paid, and a mortgage at 4% with a clause of enlargement to 5 if the payment of the interest be deferred, so that the former shall be deemed a conscientious, the latter an unrighteous bargain, all these and other cases that might be instanced are plainly rules of positive law supported only by the reverence that is shown, and generally very properly shown, to a series of former determinations that the rule of property may be uniform and steady. Nay, sometimes a precedent is so strictly followed that a particular judgment founded upon special circumstances gives rise to a general rule. In short, if a court of equity in England did really act as a very ingenious writer in the other part of the island supposes it, from theory, to do, it would rise above all law, either common or statute, and be a most arbitrary legislator in every particular case. No wonder he is so often mistaken. Grotius or Puffendorf, or any of the great masters of jurisprudence, would have been as little able to discover by their own light the system of a court of equity in England as the system of a court of law, especially as the notions before mentioned of the character, power, and practice of a court of equity were formally adopted and propagated, though not without approbation of the thing, by our principal antiquarians and lawyers, Spellman, Coke, Lambard, and Selden, and even the great Bacon himself. But this was in the infancy of the courts of equity, before their jurisdiction was settled, and when the chancellors themselves, partly from their ignorance of law, being frequently bishops or statesmen, partly from ambition and lust of power, encouraged by the arbitrary principles of the age they lived in, but principally from the narrow and unjust decisions of the courts of law, had arrogated to themselves such unlimited authority as hath totally been disclaimed by their successors for now above a century past. The decrees of a court of equity were then rather in the nature of awards, formed on the sudden pro re nata, with more probity of intention than knowledge of the subject. 
founded on no settled principles as never being designed and therefore never used for precedence. But the systems of jurisprudence in our courts, both of law and equity, are now equally artificial systems founded in the same principles of justice and positive law, but varied by different usages in the forms and mode of their proceedings, the one being originally derived, though much reformed and improved, from the feudal customs as they prevailed in the different ages in the Saxon and Norman judicatures, the other, but with equal improvements, from the imperial and pontifical formularies introduced by their clerical chancellors. The suggestion, indeed, of every bill to give jurisdiction to the courts of equity, copied from those early times, is that the complaint hath no remedy at the common law. But he who should from thence conclude that no case is judged of in equity where there might have been relief at law, and at the same time casts his eye on the extent and variety of the cases in our equity reports, must think the law a dead letter indeed. The rules of property, rules of evidence, and rules of interpretation in both courts are, or should be, exactly the same. Both ought to adopt the best, or must cease to be courts of justice. Formerly some causes which now no longer exist might occasion a different rule to be followed in one court from what was afterwards adopted in the other, as founded in the nature and reason of the thing. But the instant those causes cease, the measure of substantial justice ought to have been the same in both. Thus the penalty of a bond, originally contrived to evade the absurdity of those monkish constitutions which prohibited taking interest for money, was therefore very pardonably considered as the real debt in the courts of law when the debtor neglected to perform his agreement for the return of the loan with interest. For the judges could not, as the law then stood, give judgment that the interest should be specifically paid. But when afterwards the taking of interest became legal, as the necessary companion of commerce, nay, after the statute of 37 Henry VIII C9 had declared the debt or loan itself to be the just and true intent for which the obligation was given, their narrow-minded successors still adhered willfully and technically to the letter of the ancient precedents and refused to consider the payment of principal, interest, and costs as a full satisfaction of the bond. At the same time, more liberal men, who sate in the courts of equity, construed the instrument according to its just and true intent as merely a security for the loan, in which light it was certainly understood by the parties at least after these determinations, and therefore this construction should have been universally received. So in mortgages, being only a landed as the other is a personal security for the money lent, the payment of principal, interest, and costs ought at any time before judgment executed to have saved the forfeiture in a court of law as well as in a court of equity. And the inconvenience as well as injustice of putting different constructions in different courts upon one and the same transaction obliged the Parliament at length to interfere and to direct by the statutes 4 and 5 and C-16 and 7 George II C-20 that, in cases of bonds and mortgages, what had long been the practice of the courts of equity should also for the future be followed in the courts of law. Again, neither a court of equity nor of law can vary men's wills or agreements, or, in other words, make wills or agreements for them. Both are to understand them truly, and therefore both of them uniformly. One court ought not to extend, nor the other abridge, a lawful provision deliberately settled by the parties contrary to its just intent. A court of equity, no more than a court of law, can relieve against the penalty in the nature of stated damages, as a rent of five pounds an acre for ploughing up ancient meadow, nor against the lapse of time where the time is material to the contract, as in covenants for renewal of leases. Both courts will equitably construe, but neither pretends to control or change the lawful stipulation or engagement. End 
of Chapter 27, Part 1. Chapter 27, Part 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 3, by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Proceedings in the Courts of Equity, Part 2. The rules of decision are in both courts equally opposite to the subjects of which they take cognizance. Where the subject matter is such as requires to be determined, secundum aequum et bonum, as generally upon actions on the case, the judgments of the courts of law are guided by the most liberal equity. In matters of positive right, both courts must submit to and follow those ancient and invariable maxims quae relicta sunt et tradita. Both follow the law of nations and collect it from history and the most approved authors of all countries where the question is the object of that law, as in the case of the privileges of ambassadors, hostages, or ransom bills. In mercantile transactions, they follow the marine law and argue from the usages and authorities received in all maritime countries. Where they exercise a concurrent jurisdiction, they both follow the law of the proper forum. In matters originally of ecclesiastical cognizance, they both equally adopt the canon or imperial law according to the nature of the subject. And if a question came before either, which is properly the object of a foreign municipal law, they would both receive information what is the rule of the country and would both decide accordingly. Such, then, being the parity of law and reason which govern both species of courts, wherein, it may be asked, does their essential difference consist? It principally consists in the different modes of administering justice in each, in the mode of proof, the mode of trial, and the mode of relief. Upon these, and upon two other accidental grounds of jurisdiction, which were formally driven into those courts by narrow decisions of the courts of law, viz. the true construction of securities for money lent and the form and effect of a trust or second use. Upon these main pillars hath been gradually erected that structure of jurisprudence which prevails in our courts of equity and is inwardly bottomed upon the same substantial foundations as the legal system which hath hitherto been delineated in these commentaries, however different they may appear in their outward form from the different taste of their architects. 1. And first, to the mode of proof. When facts or their leading circumstances rest only in the knowledge of the party, a court of equity applies itself to his conscience and purges him upon oath with regard to the truth of the transaction, and that being once discovered, the judgment is the same in equity as it would have been at law. But for want of this discovery at law, the courts of equity have acquired a concurrent jurisdiction with every other court in matters of account. As incident to accounts, they take a concurrent cognizance of the administration of personal assets, consequently of debts, legacies, the distribution of the residue, and the conduct of executors and administrators. As incident to accounts, they also take the concurrent jurisdiction of tithes and all questions relating thereto, of all dealings in partnership and many other mercantile transactions, and so of bailiffs, receivers, factors, and agents. It would be endless to point out all the several avenues in human affairs and in this commercial age which lead to or end in accounts. From the same fruitful source, the compulsive discovery upon oath, the courts of equity have acquired a jurisdiction over almost all matters of fraud, all matters in the private knowledge of the party, which, though concealed, are binding in conscience, and all judgments at law obtained through such fraud or concealment. And this, not by impeaching or reversing the judgment itself, but by prohibiting the plaintiff from taking any advantage of a judgment obtained by suppressing the truth, and which, 
had the same facts appeared on the trial as now are discovered, he would never have obtained at all. 2. As to the mode of trial, this is by interrogatories administered to witnesses upon which their depositions are taken in writing wherever they happen to reside. If, therefore, the cause arises in a foreign country and the witnesses reside upon the spot, if, in causes arising in England, the witnesses are abroad or shortly to leave the kingdom, or if witnesses residing at home are aged or infirm, any of these cases lays a ground for a court of equity to grant a commission to examine them and, in consequence, to exercise the same jurisdiction which might have been exercised at law if the witnesses could probably attend. 3. With respect to the mode of relief. The want of a more specific remedy than can be obtained in the courts of law gives a concurrent jurisdiction to a court of equity in a great variety of cases, to instance in executory agreements. A court of equity will compel them to be carried into strict execution unless where it is improper or impossible instead of giving damages for their non-performance. And hence a fiction is established that what ought to be done shall be considered as being actually done, and shall relate back to the time when it ought to have been done originally. And this fiction is so closely pursued through all its consequences that it necessarily branches out into many rules of jurisprudence which form a certain regular system. So of waste and other similar injuries, a court of equity takes a concurrent cognizance in order to prevent them by injunction. Over questions that may be tried at law, in a great multiplicity of actions, a court of equity assumes a jurisdiction to prevent the expense and vexation of endless litigations and suits. In various kinds of frauds, it assumes a concurrent jurisdiction, not only for the sake of a discovery, but of a more extensive and specific relief, as by setting aside fraudulent deeds, decreeing reconveyances, or directing an absolute conveyance merely to stand as a security. And thus, lastly, for the sake of a more beneficial and complete relief by decreeing a sale of lands, a court of equity holds plea of all debts, encumbrances, and charges that may affect it or issue thereout. 4. The true construction of securities for money lent is another fountain of jurisdiction in courts of equity. When they held the penalty of a bond to be the form, and that in substance it was only as a pledge to secure the repayment of the sum bona fide advanced, with a proper compensation for the use, they laid the foundation of a regular series of determinations which have settled the doctrine of personal pledges or securities and are equally applicable to mortgages of real property. The mortgagor continues owner of the land, the mortgagee of the money lent upon it. But this ownership is mutually transferred and the mortgagor is barred from redemption if, when called upon by the mortgagee, he does not redeem within a time limited by the court, or he may, when out of possession, be barred by length of time by analogy to the statute of limitations. 5. The form of a trust or second use gives the courts of equity an exclusive jurisdiction as to the subject matter of all settlements and devises in that form and of all the long terms created in the present complicated mode of conveyancing. This is a very ample source of jurisdiction, but the trust is governed by very nearly the same rules as would govern the estate in a court of law if no trustee was interposed and by a regular positive system established in the courts of equity, the doctrine of trusts is now reduced to as great a certainty as that of legal estates in the courts of the common law. These are the principal, for I admit the minuter, grounds of the jurisdiction at present exercised in our courts of equity which differ, we see, very considerably from the notions entertained by strangers and even by those courts themselves before they arrive to maturity, 
as appears from the principles laid down and the jealousies entertained of their abuse by our early judicial writers cited in a former page, and which have been implicitly received and handed down by subsequent compilers without attending to those gradual accessions and derelictions by which in the course of a century this mighty river hath imperceptibly shifted its channel. Lambard, in particular, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, lays it down that equity should not be appealed unto, but only in rare and extraordinary matters, and that a good chancellor will not arrogate authority in every complaint that shall be brought before him upon whatsoever suggestion, and thereby both overthrow the authority of the courts of common law, and bring upon men such a confusion and uncertainty as hardly any man should know how or how long to hold his own assured to him. And certainly, if a court of equity were still at sea and floated upon the occasional opinion which the judge who happened to preside might entertain of conscience in every particular case, the inconvenience that would arise from this uncertainty would be a worse evil than any hardship that could follow from rules too strict and inflexible. Its powers would have become too arbitrary to have been endured in a country like this, which boasts of being governed in all respects by law and not by will. But since the time when Lambard wrote, a set of great and eminent lawyers who have successively held the great seal have by degrees erected a system of relief administered by a court of equity into a regular science which cannot be attained without study and experience any more than the science of law but from which, when understood, it may be known what remedy a suitor is entitled to expect, and by what mode of suit, as readily and with as much precision, in a court of equity as in a court of law. It were much to be wished, for the sake of certainty, peace, and justice, that each court would as far as possible follow the other in the best and most effectual rules for attaining those desirable ends. It is a maxim that equity follows the law, and in the former days the law has not scrupled to follow even that equity which was laid down by the clerical chancellors. Every one who is conversant in our ancient books knows that many valuable improvements in the state of our tenures, especially in leaseholds and copyholds, and the forms of administering justice have arisen from this single reason that the same thing was constantly effected by means of a subpoena in the chancery. And sure, there cannot be a greater solecism than that in two sovereign independent courts established in the same country, exercising concurrent jurisdiction and over the same subject matter, there should exist in a single instance two different rules of property clashing with or contradicting each other. It would carry me beyond the bounds of my present purpose to go farther into this matter. I have been tempted to go so far, because the very learned author to whom I have alluded, and whose works have given the exquisite pleasure to every contemplative lawyer, is, among many others, a strong proof how easily names and loose or unguarded expressions to be met with in the best of our writers are apt to confound a stranger, and to give him erroneous ideas of separate jurisdictions now existing in England, which never were separated in any other country in the universe. It hath also afforded me an opportunity to vindicate, on the one hand, the justice of our courts of law from being that harsh and illiberal rule which many are too ready to suppose it, and on the other, the justice of our courts of equity from being the result of mere arbitrary opinion or an exercise of dictatorial power which resides over the law of the land and corrects, amends, and controls it by the loose and fluctuating dictates of the conscience of a single judge. It is now high time to proceed to the practice of our courts of equity thus explained and thus understood. The first commencement of a suit in chancery is by preferring a bill to the Lord Chancellor in the style of a petition, humbly complaining therewith to your Lordship, your orator, A, B, that, etc. This is in the nature of a declaration at common law, or a libel and allegation in the spiritual courts, setting forth the circumstances of the case at length as some fraud, 
trust, or hardship, in tender consideration whereof, which is the usual language of the bill, and for that your orator is wholly without remedy at the common law, relief is therefore prayed at the Chancellor's hands, and also process of subpoena against the defendant to compel him to answer upon oath to all matter charged in the bill. And if it be to quiet the possession of lands, to stay waste, or to stop proceedings at law, an injunction is also prayed in the nature of the interdictum of the civil law commanding the defendant to cease. This bill must call all necessary parties, however remotely concerned in the interest, before the court. Otherwise, no decree can be made to bind them, and must be signed by counsel as a certificate of its decency and propriety. For it must not contain matter either scandalous or impertinent. If it does, the defendant may refuse to answer it till such scandal or impertinence is expunged, which is done upon an order to refer it to one of the officers of the court called a master in chancery, of whom there are in number twelve, including the master of the rolls, all of whom, so late as the reign of Queen Elizabeth, were commonly doctors of the civil law. The master is to examine the propriety of the bill, and if he reports it scandalous or impertinent, such matter must be struck out, and the defendant shall have his costs, which ought of right to be paid by the counsel who signed the bill. When the bill is filed in the office of the six clerks, who were originally all in orders, and therefore when the constitution of the court began to alter, a law was made to permit them to marry. When, I say, the bill is thus filed, if an injunction be prayed therein, it may be had at various stages of the cause, according to the circumstances of the case. If the bill be to stay in execution upon an oppressive judgment, and the defendant does not put in his answer within the stated time allowed by the rules of the court, an injunction will issue, of course. And when the answer comes in, the injunction can only be continued upon sufficient ground appearing from the answer itself. But if an injunction be wanted to stay waste or other injuries of an equally urgent nature, then upon the filing of the bill and a proper case supported by affidavits, the court will grant an injunction immediately to continue till the defendant has put in his answer and till the court shall make some farther order concerning it. And when the answer comes in, whether it shall then be dissolved or continued till the hearing of the cause is determined by the court upon argument drawn from considering the answer and affidavits together. But upon common bills, as soon as they are filed, process of subpoena is taken out which is a writ commanding the defendant to appear and answer to the bill on pain of a hundred pounds. But this is not all, for if the defendant on service of the subpoena does not appear within the time limited by the rules of the court and plead, demur, or answer to the bill, he is then said to be in contempt, and the respective processes of contempt are in successive order awarded against him. The first of which is an attachment, which is a writ in the nature of a copyist directed to the sheriff and commanding him to attach or take up the defendant and bring him into court. If the sheriff returns that the defendant non est inventus, then the attachment with proclamations issues, which, besides the ordinary form of attachment, directs the sheriff that he cause public proclamations to be made throughout the county to summon the defendant upon his allegiance personally to appear and answer. If this be also returned with a non est inventus, and he still stands out in contempt, a commission of rebellion is awarded against him for not obeying the proclamations according to his allegiance, and four commissioners therein named, or any of them, are ordered to attach him wheresoever he may be found in Great Britain as a rebel and contemner of the king's laws and government by refusing to attend his sovereign when thereunto required, since, as was before observed, Matters of equity were originally determined by the king in person, assisted by his council, though that business is now devolved upon his chancellor. 
If upon this commission of rebellion a non est inventus is returned, the court then sends a sergeant at arms in quest of him, and if he eludes the search of the sergeant also, then a sequestration issues to seize all his personal estate and the profits of his real, and to detain them subject to the order of the court. Sequestrations were first introduced by Sir Nicholas Bacon, Lord Keeper in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, before which the court found some difficulty in enforcing its process and decrees. After an order for sequestration issued, the plaintiff's bill is to be taken pro confesso and a decree to be made accordingly, so that the sequestration does not seem to be in the nature of process to bring in the defendant, but only intended to enforce the performance of the decree. Thus much if the defendant absconds. If the defendant is taken upon any of this process, he is to be committed to the fleet or other prison till he puts in his appearance or answer or performs whatever else this process is issued to enforce and also clears his contempts by paying the costs which the plaintiff has incurred thereby. For the same kind of process is issued out in all sorts of contempts during the progress of the cause if the parties in any point refuse or neglect to obey the order of the court. End of chapter 27, part 2. Chapter 27, part 3 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3 by William Blackstone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roy Haynes. Of Proceedings in the Courts of Equity, Part 3. The process against the body corporate is by distringus, to distrain them by their goods and chattels, rents and profits, till they shall obey the summons or directions of the court. And if a peer is a defendant, the Lord Chancellor sends a letter missive to him to request his appearance, together with a copy of the bill, and if he neglects to appear, then he may be served with a subpoena. And if he continues still in contempt, a sequestration issues out immediately against his lands and goods, without any of the mean process of attachments, etc., which are directed only against the person, and therefore cannot affect the Lord of Parliament. The same process issues against a member of the House of Commons, except only that the Lord Chancellor sends him no letter missive. The ordinary process before mentioned cannot be sued out till after service of the subpoena, for then the contempt begins. Otherwise, he is not presumed to have notice of the bill, and therefore, by absconding to avoid the subpoena, a defendant might have eluded justice till the statute 5 George II C. 25, which enacts that, where the defendant cannot be found to be served with process of subpoena, and absconds, as is believed, to avoid being served therewith, a day shall be appointed him to appear to the bill of the plaintiff, which is to be inserted in the London Gazette, read in the parish church where the defendant last lived, and fixed up at the Royal Exchange, and if the defendant doth not appear upon that day, the bill shall be taken pro confesso. But if the defendant appears regularly, and takes a copy of the bill, he is next to demur, plead, or answer. A demurrer in equity is nearly of the same nature as a demurrer in law, being an appeal to the judgment of the court whether the defendant shall be bound to answer the plaintiff's bill, as for want of sufficient matter of equity therein contained, or where the plaintiff upon his own showing appears to have no right, or where the bill seeks a discovery of a thing which may cause a forfeiture of any kind or may convict a man of any criminal misbehavior. For any of these causes, a defendant may demur to the bill, and if, on demurrer, the defendant prevails, the plaintiff's bill shall be dismissed. If the demurrer be overruled, the defendant is ordered to answer. A plea may be either to the jurisdiction, showing that the court has no cognizance of the cause, or to the person, 
showing some disability in the plaintiff as by outlawry, excommunication, and the like, or it is in bar, showing some matter wherefore the plaintiff can demand no relief as an act of parliament, a fine, a release, or a former decree. And the truth of this plea the defendant is bound to prove if put upon it by the plaintiff. But as bills are often of a complicated nature, and contains various matters, a man may plead as to part, demur as to part, and answer to the residue. But no exception to formal minutia in the pleadings will be here allowed, for the parties are at liberty on the discovery of any errors in form to amend them. An answer is the most usual defense that is made to a plaintiff's bill. It is given in upon oath or the honor of a peer or peeress. But where there are amicable defendants, their answer is usually taken without oath by consent of the plaintiff. This method of proceeding is taken from the ecclesiastical courts like the rest of the practice in chancery. For there, in almost every case, the plaintiff may demand the oath of his adversary in supply of proof. Formerly, this was done in those courts with calm purgators, in the manner of our waging of law. But this has been long disused, and instead of it, the present kind of purgation, by the single oath of the party himself, was introduced. This oath was made use of in the spiritual courts, as well in criminal cases of ecclesiastical cognizance, as in matters of civil right, and it was then usually denominated the oath ex officio, whereof the High Commission Court, in particular, made a most extravagant and illegal use forming a court of inquisition in which all persons were obliged to answer in cases of bare suspicion if the commissioners thought proper to proceed against them ex officio for any supposed ecclesiastical enormities. But when the High Commission Court was abolished by Statute 16 Charles I C. 11, this oath ex officio was abolished with it and it is also enacted by statute 13 Charles II St. 1 C. 12, that it shall not be lawful for any bishop or ecclesiastical judge to tender to any person the oath ex officio, or any other oath whereby the party may be charged or compelled to confess, accuse, or purge himself of any criminal matter. But this does not extend to oaths in a civil suit, and therefore, it is still the practice, both in the spiritual courts and in equity, to demand the personal answer of the party himself upon oath. Yet, if in the bill any question be put that tends to the discovery of any crime, the defendant may thereupon demur, as was before observed, and may refuse to answer. If the defendant lives within twenty miles of London, he must be sworn before one of the masters of the court. If farther off, there may be a didemos potestatum or commission to take his answer in the country where the commissioners administer him the usual oath, and then, the answer being sealed up, either one of the commissioners carries it up to the court, or it is sent by a messenger who swears he received it from one of the commissioners, and that the same has not been opened or altered since he received it. An answer must be signed by counsel, and must either deny or confess all the material parts of the bill, or it may confess and avoid, that is, justify or palliate the facts. If one of these is not done, the answer may be accepted to for insufficiency, and the defendant be compelled to put in a more sufficient answer. A defendant cannot pray anything in his answer but to be dismissed the court. If he has any relief to pray against the plaintiff, he must do it by an original bill of his own, which is called a cross bill. After answer put in, the plaintiff, upon payment of costs, may amend his bill, either by adding new parties or new matter, or both, upon the new lights given him by the defendant, and the defendant is obliged to answer afresh to such amended bill but this must be before the plaintiff has replied to the defendant's answer, whereby the cause is at issue. For afterwards, if new matter arises which did not exist before, he must set it forth by a supplemental bill. 
There may also be a bill of reviver when the suit is abated by the death of any of the parties in order to set the proceedings again in motion without which they remain at a stand. And there is likewise a bill of interpleader where a person who owes a debt or rent to one of the parties in suit, but till the determination of it, he knows not to which, desires that they may interplead, that he may be safe in the payment. In this last case, it is usual to order the money to be paid into court for the benefit of such of the parties to whom, upon hearing, the court shall decree it to be due. But this depends upon circumstances, and the plaintiff must also annex an affidavit to his bill, swearing that he does not collude with either of the parties. If the plaintiff finds sufficient matter confessed in the defendant's answer to ground a decree upon, he may proceed to the hearing of the cause upon bill and answer only. But in that case he must take the defendant's answer to be true in every point. Otherwise, the course is for the plaintiff to reply generally to the answer, averring his bill to be true, certain, and sufficient, and the defendant's answer to be directly the reverse which he is ready to prove as the court shall award, upon which the defendant rejoins, averring the like on his side, which is joining issue upon the facts in dispute. To prove which facts is the next concern. This is done by examination of witnesses and taking their depositions in writing according to the manner of the civil law and for that purpose interrogatories are framed, or questions in writing, which, and which only, are to be proposed to and asked of the witnesses in the cause. These interrogatories must be short and pertinent, not leading ones, as, Did not you see this? or, Did not you hear that? For if they be such, the depositions taken thereon will be suppressed and not suffered to be read. For the purpose of examining witnesses in or near London, there is an examiner's office appointed, but for evidence who live in the country, a commission to examine witnesses is usually granted to four commissioners, two named of each side, or any three or two of them, to take depositions there. And if the witnesses reside beyond the sea, a commission may be had to examine them there upon their own oaths, and if foreigners, upon the oaths of skilful interpreters. And it hath been held that the deposition of an heathen who believes in the Supreme Being, taken by commission in the most solemn manner according to the custom of his own country, may be read in evidence. The commissioners are sworn to take the examinations truly and without partiality, and not to divulge them till published in the Court of Chancery and their clerks are also sworn to secrecy. The witnesses are compellable by process of subpoena, as in the courts of common law, to appear and submit to examination. And when their depositions are taken, they are transmitted to the court with the same care that the answer of a defendant is sent. If witnesses to a disputable fact are old and infirm, it is very usual to file a bill to perpetuate the testimony of those witnesses, although no suit is depending. For it may be a man's antagonist only waits for the death of some of them to begin his suit. This is most frequent when lands are devised by will away from the heir at law, and the devisee, in order to perpetuate the testimony of the witnesses to such will, exhibits a bill in chancery against the heir and sets forth the will verbatim therein, suggesting that the heir is inclined to dispute its validity. And then the defendant, having answered, they proceed to issue, as in other cases, and examine the witnesses to the will, after which the cause is at end without proceeding to any decree, no relief being prayed by the bill, but the heir is entitled to his costs, even though he contests the will. This is what is usually meant by proving a will in chancery. When all witnesses are examined, then and not before, the depositions may be published by a rule to pass publication, after which they are open for the inspection of all the parties and copies may be taken of them. The cause is then ripe to be set down for hearing, 
which may be done at the procurement of the plaintiff or defendant before either the Lord Chancellor or the Master of the Rolls, according to the discretion of the clerk in court, regulated by the nature and importance of the suit and the arrear of causes depending before each of them respectively. Concerning the authority of the Master of the Rolls to hear and determine causes and his general power in the Court of Chancery, there were, not many years since, diverse questions and disputes very warmly agitated, to quiet which it was declared by statute 3 George II C. 30 that all orders and decrees by him made, except such as by the course of the court were appropriated to the great seal alone, should be deemed to be valid, subject nevertheless to be discharged or altered by the Lord Chancellor, and so as they shall not be enrolled till the same are signed by his Lordship. Either party may be subpoenaed to hear judgment on the day so fixed for the hearing, and then, if the plaintiff does not attend, his bill is dismissed with costs, or, if the defendant makes default, a decree will be made against him which will be final unless he pays the plaintiff's costs of attendance and shows good cause to the contrary on a day appointed by the court. A plaintiff's bill may also at any time be dismissed for want of prosecution, which is in the nature of a non-suit at law, if he suffers three terms to elapse without moving forward in the cause. When there are cross causes, on a cross bill filed by the defendant against the plaintiff in the original cause, they are generally contrived to be brought on together that the same hearing and the same decree may serve for both of them. The method of hearing causes in court is usually this. The parties on both sides appearing by their counsel, the plaintiff's bill is first opened or briefly abridged, and the defendant's answer also by the junior counsel on each side, after which the plaintiff's leading counsel states the case and the matters in issue and the points of equity arising therefrom and then such depositions as are called for by the plaintiff are read by one of the six clerks, and the plaintiff may also read such part of the defendant's answer as he thinks material or convenient, and after this the rest of the counsel for the plaintiff make their observations and arguments. Then the defendant's counsel go through the same process for him, except that they may not read any part of his answer, and the counsel for the plaintiff are heard in reply. When all are heard, the court pronounces the decree, adjusting every point in debate according to equity and good conscience, which decree, being usually very long, the minutes of it are taken down and read openly in court by the registrar. The matter of costs to be given to either party is not here held to be a point of right, but merely discretionary, by the statute 17 Richard II C6, according to the circumstances of the case as they appear more or less favorable to the party vanquished. And yet the statute 15 Henry VI C4 seems expressly to direct that as well damages as costs shall be given to the defendant if wrongfully vexed in this court. The Chancellor's decree is either interlocutory or final. It very seldom happens that the first decree can be final or conclude the cause, for if any matter of fact is strongly controverted, this court is so sensible of the deficiency of trial by written depositions that it will not bind the parties thereby, but usually directs the matter to be tried by jury, especially such important facts as the validity of a will, or whether A is the heir at law to B, or the existence of a modus decimandi, or a real and immemorial composition for tithes. But as no jury can be summoned to attend this court, the fact is usually directed to be tried at the bar of the court of King's Bench or at the Assizes upon a feigned issue. For, in order to bring it there and have the point in dispute, and that only put in issue, an action is feigned to be brought, wherein the pretended plaintiff declares that he laid wager of five pounds with the defendant, that A was heir at law to B, and then avers that he is so, 
and brings his action for the five pounds. The defendant allows the wager, but avers that A is not the heir to B, and thereupon that issue is joined, which is directed out of chancery to be tried, and thus the verdict of the jurors at law determines the fact in the court of equity. These feigned issues seem borrowed from the sponsio judicalis of the Romans, and are also frequently used in the courts of law by consent of the parties to determine some disputed right without the formality of pleading, and thereby save much time and expense in the decision of a cause. So likewise, if a question of mere law arises in the course of a cause, as whether by the words of a will an estate for life or entail is created, or whether a future interest devised by a testator shall operate as a remainder or an executory devise, it is the practice of this court to refer it to the opinion of the judges of the court of King's Bench upon a case stated for that purpose, wherein all the material facts are admitted and the point of law is submitted to their decision who thereupon hear it solemnly argued by counsel on both sides and certify their opinion to the chancellor and upon such certificate the decree is usually founded another thing also retards the completion of decrees frequently long accounts are to be settled encumbrances and debts to be inquired into and a hundred little facts to be cleared up before a decree can do full and sufficient justice these matters are always by the decree on the first hearing referred to a master in chancery to examine, which examinations frequently last for years, and then he is to report the fact, as it appears to him, to the court. This report may be accepted to, disproved, and overruled, or otherwise it is confirmed and made absolute by order of the court. When all issues are tried and settled, and all references to the master ended, the cause is again brought to hearing upon the matters of equity reserved, and a final decree is made, the performance of which is enforced, if necessary, by commitment of the person or sequestration of the party's estate. And if by this decree either party thinks himself aggrieved, he may petition the Chancellor for a rehearing whether it was heard before his lordship or any of the judges sitting for him or before the master of the rolls. For whoever may have heard the cause, it is the chancellor's decree and must be signed by him before it is enrolled, which is done, of course, unless a rehearing be desired. Every petition for a rehearing must be signed by two counsel of character, usually such as have been concerned in the cause, certifying that they apprehend the cause is proper to be reheard. And upon the rehearing, all the evidence taken in the cause, whether read before or not, is now admitted to be read, because it is the decree of the Chancellor himself, who only now sits to hear reasons why it should not be enrolled and perfected, at which time all omissions of either evidence or argument may be supplied. But after the decree is once signed and enrolled, it cannot be reheard or rectified, but by bill of review or by appeal to the House of Lords. A bill of review may be had upon apparent error in judgment appearing on the face of the decree, or by special leave of the court upon oath made of the discovery of new matter or evidence which could not possibly be had or used at the time when the decree passed but no new evidence or matter then in the knowledge of the parties and which might have been used before shall be a sufficient ground for a bill of review an appeal to parliament that is to the house of lords is the dernier resort of the subject who thinks himself aggrieved by any interlocutory order or final determination in this court and it is effected by petition to the House of Peers, and not by writ of error, as upon judgments at common law. This jurisdiction is said to have begun in 18 James I, and certainly the first petition which appears in the records of Parliament was preferred in that year, and the first that was heard and determined, though the name of appeal was then a novelty, was presented in a few months after 
both leveled against the Lord Keeper Bacon for corruption and other misbehavior. It was afterwards warmly controverted by the House of Commons in the reign of Charles II, but this dispute is now at rest, it being obvious to the reason of all mankind that when the courts of equity became the principal tribunals for deciding causes of property, a revision of their decrees, by way of appeal, became equally necessary as a writ of error from the judgment of the court at law and upon the same principle from decrees of the Chancellor relating to the Commissioners for the Dissolution of Chauntries, etc., under the statute 37 Henry VIII C4, as well as for charitable uses under statute 43 Elizabeth C4, an appeal to the King in Parliament was always unquestionably allowed. But no new evidence is admitted in the House of Lords upon any account, for this is a distinct jurisdiction, which differs it very considerably from those instances wherein the same jurisdiction revises and corrects its own acts, as in rehearings and bills of review. For it is a practice unknown to our law, though constantly followed in the spiritual courts, when a superior court is reviewing the sentence of an inferior to examine the justice of the former decree by evidence that was never produced below. This is the general method of proceeding in the courts of equity. End of chapter 27, part 3. End of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, book 3 of Private Wrongs by William Blackstone.